Happy Friday night, Sifters. It's Game Face episode 152, our last regular episode of Game Face for 2018. It's been a crazy ride this year, but everything is starting to wrap up. We have one more episode before the year's over, though, and as you probably guessed, that is our Game of the Year for 2018 episode. That is going down on Tuesday, so just four or five days to wait for the next episode. It'll be our Game of the Year where we pick winners and runners up in, what was it last year, like 15 categories? 13, I think it was. I don't remember. Somewhere around there. Um, so that'll be on Tuesday, and it'll probably be at 5 p.m. Pacific again, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Seems to be working out for us. Of course, it's already dark here because mm -hmm. it's like the dead of winter. Um, otherwise, though, uh, it's been a great year. I want to thank all you guys for hanging with us on the stream all the way throughout 2018. Uh, thanks to everybody who subscribed via Twitch Prime throughout the year. That has turned out to be a nice revenue stream for us. In fact, some of you guys may be ready to uh, re-up your sub on tonight's stream. Uh, so I just want to thank you guys for sticking with that. I know it's a pain in the butt to have to do it every month. Um, I probably wouldn't want to have to do it, so I appreciate you guys going the extra mile. It does absolutely make a difference for us. And the year is winding down. Uh, yeah. Not Got, much left. Yeah, I mean, all the big games are out. We talked about the last one, last or the last two last week, Just Cause mm -hmm. 4 and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, so tonight's show is a little bit angled towards indies. Uh, there's a couple of big indie releases that came out this uh, week that we're going to talk about, a couple other bigger games. But I will say right off the top that I think you're probably going to be getting off the stream here in an hour and a half or two hours. It's not one of our bigger episodes. We only have four topics for tonight's show. So I know I've said that before, and the show's gone much longer, but... Yeah. I think that'll be that yeah, usually, will be the case. That happens when it's like, you know, news topics that have more stuff going on with yeah. them, whereas these are more. Uh, it's, these are all games. A lot of times too, if our show ends up coming in shorter than usual, we'll do an extended Q and A or something mm -hmm. to make up for it. So, and we probably will. We'll do a little more Q and A this episode than normal. Uh, but with that, let's get on with the show. We got some great stuff to talk about, and we're going to kick things off with Devil May Cry Five. Matt, when I came over and you saw the rundown. Uh, you were puzzled as to why we'd be talking about Devil May mm -hmm. Cry 5. And the reason we are talking about it is because there, there was, I'm not sure if it's still there, but there was a free demo on, on exclusive to Xbox, I mm -hmm. should add, uh, that was up this week, and I downloaded Good, it. We're getting the word out, Capcom. Yeah, so that was my point. That's what I was getting at, is that I don't think anybody even realized that. I had that, no idea. I mean, we curated a story to Sifted, but it's like, you know. And I look at the Xbox store almost every day. Yeah, and it was buried in there. It was hard to find. Um, but yeah, there was a demo of Devil May Cry 5, a free demo, up on Xbox Live all week. Again, not 100% sure it's still there, uh, but I did download it and I did play it. Um, it's about a 20 minute-ish demo, and the way the demo works is you start from the beginning every time you die. So mm. there is a boss fight at the end, and I will fully admit that I never did defeat the boss. Um, when you lose to the boss, you would start right back here again so i played it three times i think never did manage to beat the boss i got him down pretty close on my last run uh, but was unable to beat him but i did spend a lot of time with the combat and understanding kind of how the gameplay loop works and how the level design works and uh it is 100 percent devil may cry uh, hmm. without a doubt this isn't some kind of spin-offy thing where you'll play it and you'll be like wait a minute how is this devil may cry it is died in the wool legit devil may cry um, the control scheme in the game is very simple on the outside, but as you start playing, you start to understand how they've kind of layered the depth into the game. So you basically just have three buttons. You have an attack button for your sword, you have a gun button, and then you have a devil trigger button. Now, the devil trigger is not something that's new to the franchise, but the way that they handle it in this is a little different. So for those of you who don't know, the devil trigger is basically these bracers that you get on his arm on Nero's arm and I, I'm assuming that this demo is set up in a way that they just give you several of them right out of the gate mm -hmm. but if you play the real game you probably have to earn them as you go uh, but for this demo's purposes they gave you three different uh, devil triggers that you could use and each one of them basically gives Nero or Dante special abilities so one of them it's almost like this sonar type of blast that you can use up close but then you can also use it to sort of teleport around. Um, and you can also use it to grapple to enemies. And you can grapple enemies to you to pull them in to start a combo. Um, and then the other two that I used were just kind of like you're seeing one right now. It's kind of an electricity attack. 
that shocks enemies and kind of freezes them. Um, but the way that the devil triggers are handled is a little weird. So you can't see it right now. Actually, maybe just take down the graphic just for a second, Sam. See the bottom right there? That's where you see the three different abilities that you have. And so you, it took me forever to figure out, okay, how do I switch through the triggers? Mm. How can I choose which one I want? And I had found a button that would do it, but every time it would, so you can see there, it says like overture, four out of four. I found a way to do it, but when I would do that, it would take away one of the abilities from that trigger. So if I would switch with the left shoulder button, it would take away one of the old triggers and then switch to the new one. So I thought that was wrong. I thought I was doing something wrong. It turns out that is actually how it works. That's how you swap the devil triggers. When you go to swap one, you're gonna sacrifice one of the charges from that devil trigger. Mm. Um, it is an interesting change because in the old games, uh, devil trigger was just sort of, you know, the meter thing filled up and you hit the button and you turned into a de demon for 30 seconds and yep. rip wrecked house and that was the end of it. Now, I'm not 100% sure how many total triggers are going to be in the final game, but if there are three in the demo, I'm guessing there's probably going to be five or six. That's my guess anyway. Um, using the sword, uh, you can... The combos are pretty simple when you're on the ground. It seems like Nero has like a three or four hit combo that just kind of repeats over and over. Uh, you can hold the attack to do a powered up attack. Uh, and then if you have a jump button, of course, and that's where you kind of get into more of the depth of the combat because you can jump and then while you're in the air, you can kind of lift enemies off the ground and juggle them midair. It's, it's Devil May Cry. It's what has been a part of Devil May Cry all along. And then there's the gun button and mixing all those three things in there, you obviously try to go for as stylish a combat as possible. And there's ratings that pop up kind of in the middle right hand side of the screen. Uh, for the most of my for the most of my playtime, it was pretty demoralizing because I kept getting a D for dismal. Hmm. Uh, so I never really figured out how to string together like hundred hit combos, which are absolutely a possibility in this and every other Devil May Cry. I think the longest hit combo I had was like twenty or something like that. I never did get a double S throughout all my time playing the demo, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, a big part of Devil May Cry to get those higher ratings is mixing up the combat. So mixing in the gun with the sword, with the leaping, with the devil trigger. And if you mix that stuff up, the better you mix that stuff up, the higher ratings you get. And then ultimately when you finish a level, you get rated on that level, blah, blah, blah. Again, very much Devil May Cry. Now the one thing I would say that kind of surprised me about this game is that the level design has not changed. Um, we're in this era of open world, freedom, go wherever you want, do whatever you want. Devil May Cry 5 is very much a throwback in that it is 100% linear, and the levels are basically 100% linear. There's a couple like side paths you can go down and maybe find some red orbs or some green orbs. But for the most part, it's just this track that you run down. Um, and even in this demo, there's some very simple puzzle stuff. You pick up this item... You have to take it back to this other place. It's like this weird, like, heart that has legs. Hmm. And then you insert it into this vagina-looking thing, and then it, like, crumbles the wall down. So there's very simple puzzle-like stuff. Um, and again, that's something that you would find in Devil May Cry and past entries in the franchise. Um, and again, like other Devil May Cry games, you can upgrade pretty much everything. You can upgrade your devil triggers. You can upgrade your sword, your gun. And that is done, if, if, you, if you were paying attention to the B-roll early on, uh, you see a scene with a girl. Well, that girl is like your, basically your mediary between you and the office. And she cruises around in a van. And at the beginning of this demo, the van rolls up and kind of parks in the middle of the level. And that is where you go to, and here, here is what I was talking about earlier, where you get this item and then you have to take it to this other place to use it. Uh, but the van is where you go to upgrade all your stuff. And it's disabled in the demo. You can't do any upgrades. And I think a big part of that is because they've already kind of powered you up for the demo. Um, Story-wise, writing-wise, not great. What have I experienced, I've experienced so far? They, it tries to be funny because it is Devil May Cry. It's kind of one of those tongue-in-cheek franchises, lots of corny one-liners and things like that. Nero's writing is not too bad. Like the boss fight at the end, he has a dialogue back and forth with this hideous creature. And that has some levity, some funny moments to it. Uh, but for the most part, the writing fall, falls flat, at least what I've, I've experienced from this. Uh, this. They don't really tell you a whole lot about the story in the demo, so I don't have a really solid grasp. Like, when you fight the boss at the end, he talks about how he's trying to 
gather as much human blood as possible so he can be the king of the underworld but then presumably you kill him so i i don't that's probably not a major part of the story arc um performance wise the engine runs great it's i would venture to guess it's 60 frames per second i was playing it on the base xbox one and that's what you're seeing here right now uh the game looks good even on the base xbox one which i can't say about a lot of third party games in 2018 mm -hmm. Um, maybe they put an increased focus on this because they had some kind of a marketing plan all along with Microsoft. I don't know. It's a little odd that this demo only appeared on Xbox. At least I think it is. I think it's because uh, it's yeah, it's the E3 demo. So, and I think they were showing that on Xbox. Were they? Yeah. Almost everything was being shown on Xbox at E3. Yeah, at E3 2018, you're right. Xbox One X, a lot of stuff was being shown. And you may be right. Maybe they had the work done already and they're just like, well... Yeah. Because I think... Uh, I'd, I'd be shocked if there wasn't a multi-platform demo later. So here she comes in the van that you use to uh, upgrade. But again, in the demo, you weren't able to use it. So I wasn't really able to go through the trees mm -hmm. and see just how far you could go, how deep it, it went. Um, but, I mean, I would say overall, I really enjoyed my time playing this game. It is a bit of a throwback. It does feel like an older game in some ways. Um, but... You know, every once in a while, I don't mind that. I, I don't mind a more straightforward experience that has more of a focus on your skills than, hey, look at this gorgeous level design, or here's all this adventuring and discovery that you can do. And I think in particular for this franchise, that sort of level design makes a lot more sense than it does for others. Would I like to see eventually an open world take on Devil May Cry? Sure. Um, do I feel like I need it to enjoy this game right now? No, absolutely not. I had a ton of fun with this game. And I, again, I played the demo over several times, and I actually enjoyed it more every time because I got better at the combat and started to understand sort of the ebb and flow of how things work. Uh, so I think Devil May Cry 5 is looking good. It's coming in a couple months. Uh, it won't be that long until everybody gets to play it. And like you said, I would not be surprised if this demo appears on PS4 here during the Christmas holiday or maybe early in the year next year. Um, but right now, it's only on Xbox, and I don't even know if it's still up there for download at this point. So you might be able to give it a go this weekend, but I'm not 100% certain. Matt, what what would you like to see change from prior Devil May Cry games, other than what I just talked about with the sort of restrictive level design? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think they pretty much perfected it in 3. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, the Ninja Theory game was fine, but I don't have a huge attachment to... The established Dante character, uh, so I didn't mind the changes there. I yeah. thought it was a good game. Uh, four, I thought was a little meh, uh, in part because you weren't playing as Dante anymore, and in part because it did that thing where you you play through half of the game and then you turn around and go back the way you came for the rest of the second half of the game. It was and, a small game, yeah. but they found a cheap way to try to extend its life. Um, and I hope that's not what happens here. I hope this isn't enough. I mean, they did announce this and release it in, what, an eight-month period total? Yeah, but it doesn't look like they only spent eight months on no, it. No, absolutely not. Um, but I'm like, you know, at this point, I just sort of hope they, they... They don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, I guess would be what I'd say about this series. Like, just look at what you did right in 3 and do that again. Um, you know, apply modern tech, apply modern... You know, the, the hardware power to, to let you do some things with it that you maybe couldn't do or couldn't do fully before. But, like, I don't, th I don't think Devil May Cry really needs uh, a massive reinvention to make a good... I mean, maybe it does to sell the numbers that maybe Capcom wants it to, but I don't know. Like, this game has its audience, and I don't know how much further it's going to go, but uh, it's probably better to keep the fan base happy that has kept the series going since 2001 or so than it is to try to capture a bunch of people that have never heard of it before. How long has it been since the last DMC? Not counting the Ninja Theory one. Oh, since... That would be since four? Yeah. Was that? That would be... That was like 2009. Nine? Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Holy crap. That's a yeah. long time. It has been a long time. I wonder, too, if they're... You know, obviously people like us know Devil May Cry, and we're fans of it, but I wonder if the new generation of players... It's a good question. I mean, I think they'll care once they see this, and it looks cool. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't think the numeral five at the end of the title is a big deterrent in a video game. No, not at all. Especially a game that, I mean, who, I mean, does it matter the story? You know, do you need to know what happened in the other four? No. In this franchise, not, no. no, not at all. <laughs> you definitely don't need there's to know. There's demons, there's swords, there's guns. Look cool, go. Yeah, like, it's, pretty it's all much. You need. Well, I wonder about the design, though. 
since it is kind of a throwback to the games of yore, if mm-hmm. uh, if new players will resonate with it as much. They seem to like Bayonetta okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's not... Uh, there isn't. This the thing is there isn't really anything else like these anymore. You know, there's you got Devil May Cry. Some would say there's a reason for that. Well, I think the reason is they're hard to make. Like you know, it's easy to make a shitty character action game. Yeah. Um, it's also got a little bit more. It's more of a Japan centric subgenre. Like you know, like they do the character action stuff better than pretty much anybody. So it's not surprising that like you don't see that come out of the West very often. Um, the closest we probably get were those terrible Russian games, uh, X Blades. Yeah, remember those? <laughs> yeah, Bla- or Blades of Time or something like that. Yeah. yeah, like it never quite comes off right. And I think um, you know you've got uh, this. This you got Bayonetta. There's, I think there's another one that I'm forgetting. Well, the new Bayonetta is coming to Switch. Yeah. Um, so like, it's like basically it's like these guys in Platinum. Pretty much. They're the ones who make the, these, these, yeah. this type of game now. And uh, you know, Platinum's famous for applying kind of that combat style to almost anything you can think of, up to yeah. it including licensed Ninja Turtle games and Transformers games. Um, the combat in this does feel amazing. Mm-hmm. It is it's so responsive, so quick. Yeah, and so actually, fast, I, so actually, deep. I would argue that Dark Siders Three is a good example of why most people don't attempt it. Yeah, because it doesn't That's turn out point. too well. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of Devil May Cry influence in Dark Siders Three. But there's very little that lives up to the legacy of Dark Siders or of Devil May Cry in Dark Siders Three. That's that's a very uh, it's a, good it's point. a hard thing to do right. Yep. But so. based upon what I've played of this so far, they're absolutely nailing it. They're doing a really good job. I am excited to play more of this game. Um, I might even play through the demo again and try to finally beat the boss and see hmm. what happens after I beat him. Um, but. Uh, I don't want to say yet it's a return to form for the franchise. I know a lot of people are disappointed by DMC Devil May Cry. I wasn't one of them. I thought it was a good game. Um, I think a lot of people were just more concerned about the character and things like that than mm-hmm. actually what it was like to play it. But I feel like in Devil May Cry 5, they're getting both. They're getting the characters that they love, the characters that they want to play as, and they're getting a throwback to that more traditional style of game in the vein of what made it popular in the first place. So, uh, to me... Game's shaping up pretty well. It's looking pretty good. Hey, it's running well on Xbox One. Yep. <laughs> That's apparently no, no small feat anymore. Again, this is being played on base Xbox One, not Xbox One X. So, uh, pretty auspicious demo. If you guys can go out there and get it, I definitely recommend going and snagging it. It is absolutely free on Xbox. I think it will probably appear on PlayStation. It may not, though. Uh, so, if you have both, I would recommend just going and grabbing it for Xbox right now and giving it a whirl this weekend. Hmm. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about one of two indie games that we're going to talk about in this episode. Uh, And this one, reviews came out yesterday. Yesterday or the night before. Yeah. Uh, The game is called, I believe it's called Grease. Yeah, Grease. 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 Okay. Spanish for gray. Oh, okay. Um, It's also a lot of other languages for gray, but since the developer's in Barcelona, I figure it's Spanish. That's Barcelona. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Driving me crazy when I went there that everybody pronounced it that way, but I guess that's the proper way to pronounce it. Um, so I've not played Greece. Mm. Greece. <laughs> Greece. You have. Yeah. Uh, this game is getting really high review yeah. scores. Also, some of my Swedish friends are amused because apparently that means pig there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what they said. They said it's a, it means some, It means pig, I think. And I wonder if that's like the origin of the word gristle that we use. Yeah, it might be. It's possible. Anyway, um... This game has been getting sky-high review scores. Like, people gushing over it. I think there was, of all the reviews we curated for this, there was one that was negative. I think that was US Gamer. IGN dinged it pretty hard, Did too. It? They gave it a 6.5 out of 10. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't see that. Um, for being, basically for being beautiful but not difficult, which is like, I don't, I don't know if you really get what they're after in this game. Um, but uh, Everything's got to be a Souls clone now, man. Yeah, it was a weird... Uh, yeah, I saw that tweet, too, um, <laughs> from the Rock, Paper, Shotgun guy. Yeah. I don't understand what he's talking about in that tweet. I don't I, 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 And everybody kept asking for examples, and he didn't give any. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what he's saying. Because I, I play... I like Dark Souls. If there were a lot of Dark Souls likes, I'd totally want to play them, but, but I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, I don't either. But um, Grease is... Um, it's a... You know, it's an indie side-scrolling platformer. Uh, so naturally, it is about depression. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> it doesn't have to be a platformer for that. Uh, it's an indie game, so of course it's about depression. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but if it's, an, it's a side-scrolling plat- platformer, you know it is. Yeah. 
But uh, so basically, you you play uh, as I've seen it described. The the, the girl here is uh, is Greece. She's you know play, gray. She's in her gray robe. Because she's um, depressed, man. Well, she's she's not though because. Um, <laughs> You, it seems to take place somewhat in the psyche of a girl who's in mourning or in the stages of grief or something like that, and you see her as the as the giant statue of a of a crying woman that you start the game in, and she you know crumbles or whatever, and you drop very far into this you know, sort of ruined world, and you go through all these pla kind of platform areas. You 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 cover the same ground several times. So like it's just, it's all takes place in a fairly small area. But uh, the trick is you're you're basically looking for um, to get through each platforming area, and you'll get to a new uh, stone hand of the girl usually, and that will be where you sort of do this like kind of like kind of she rolls into kind of a ball, and a new color is added to the world. Okay. So you're adding colors to the world. So the first one is red, and it, and it turns the 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 world's kind of gray here. When you add red, it it turns. Um, it turns the world into sort of a blasted desert, like a like a like a. It's like you know, presumably the the anger part of the grief process sort of thing, and you have to deal with uh, winds that will blow you back if you're on shelter and stuff. Like. And then like later on after that, you get green uh, is the next color, and that causes uh, plant life to bloom again. And that become you do some Tarzan style sliding down vines and jumping on various trees and things like that. And I'll, over the course of the game, and you see here. You, you have these little like orbs that help you get places and the key part of the orbs is you use the orbs to get new abilities so this is um this is a, so this is after green has been unlocked uh and this is the second ability you get. the first one you get is to smash down in a big heavy block and the second one is you get to double jump and glide and then if you find these uh little little red uh butterfly bird things you can super jump straight up okay and as you get it it's it's a little metroidy in the sense that as you get uh, each of these abilities, you then can then access new parts of the world that you've been been before, and it, it's very elegant in how it kind of guides you into where you need to go. I never got lost once, even though there's no no real map. There's no um, there's no real no way to know where you are uh, beyond where you know just looking around your immediate surroundings. But I never got lost. Even when, like, I was re retreading the same areas with new additions because of the new ability I got, it always guided me pretty, very transparently and very, um, uh, I would say, pretty elegantly into where I needed to be next. I never got stuck. Uh, I got stuck in a couple of platforming, like two platforming things maybe, but beyond that, like, I never got a, had a, hit a point where I'm like, well, I got to look up where I need to go next because this thing got too obtuse. Never does that. What's um, the deal with the transforming platforms? Will it go from like a square to a triangle or whatever? Yeah, that, that's part of the green edition. So those are like kind of trees and bushes and they will, you know, they're, if, they, if you've ever played the Mega Man levels where the, the blocks appear and reappear, yeah. like that's, uh, it's pretty much that. That's like all it is. Platform okay. and stuff like that. There are a couple of you know, areas. She wasn't manually doing it. Like there the are, isn't there are places it. where they shift when you jump. Okay. But that's not once very you're common. in air, they'll change. No, like every time you press the jump button, they oh, switch. Oh, that can so you have to, some pretty so you have to navigate buttons. based on you can only jump, you know where where you get. And then here, here's like so you've got the double jump now, and uh, so they start adding things where like if you're going the other way across. How you do have, you know that those platforms are going to be there? Because you see them. Before you make that first jump, you don't though. Well, they're a pattern. You just you got to watch. Okay, so they just go in a sequence. Yeah, you can watch the patterns. patterns. Okay, yeah, gotcha. The, All right. So she's like going to hover there. Yeah, there right. you go. Okay, got now it. Now that one's going to disappear, and she's going to double jump and hover, and, and then she lands. You know, just in time because if you, she didn't hover, uh, she, she would have fallen because yeah. it didn't appear in time. So it's that kind of thing, and uh, you know, as you go on, like there's you know the the, the, the it goes some the the colors add that you add uh, kind of create some surprising situations. You know, here you go. What's look, going you, on here? That you should, so all those red bird things, that's when you're on one of those red bird things, you can do a super jump. And so there's red bird things everywhere, so she can super jump as much as, as she wants. As much as she place. wants. Okay, got ya. There's no limit to how many super jumps you can do as long as you keep finding red birds. Now, you can't die, right? No. There's no there's, death in this no game. No death. Which is the polar opposite of the game we're about to talk about next. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you can't die. Um... 
you can get stuck, but you can't die. Uh, there's no way to get, uh, you, know, you can get stuck in the sense that you don't know what to do, but there's yeah. no way to end up in a situation where you have to start over or, you, you know, nothing like that. Um, I guess it's been, it's been criticized a little bit for that. that. You know, it's like, oh, there's no threat because there's, there are scenes where like, um, eventually in the game, the depression or the bad thing that the girl is upset about is personified by a giant black mass of goo that takes the form of like a really loud, annoying bird and a scary moray eel that chases you. But like the moray eel chases you through this area. What's going on with the sperm box there? <laughs> Looks like what? she was in the shape of a box with like little sperms falling. Oh, that's her. That's the the weight okay. ability. So if you're in, in midair when you do that, you smash. That's down. the first ability. You yeah. Get? Okay. And if you do it on the ground, you just you just can't be blown away by the wind. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. Um, and the little 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 white dots are um, they're like little sprites that you can find, and like you need them to unlock keys or like unlock bridges. Like they'll form like star signs basically. They're stars, and they. They'll unlock your new abilities and they'll unlock uh, bridges to get you to different places. This little sequence right here is amazing. Yeah. So this with is the bird. So this, yeah, the bird is is that's the personification of the depression, basically. Okay. It'll chase you around, but it can't hurt. It can't kill you. Yeah. Um. There's nothing can. <laughs> no. There's the the moray eel thing will chase you around a lot, but like you know. And, and what then, happens if you just and stop? It feels, oh, they, they still just yell at you. Like the like even if you just stop when you're being chased by the eel. Like, you'll just automatically get out of its mouth in time. Uh, like, you can stay ahead of it faster and do it a little better manually, but you don't need to play it. Now, how do you feel about that? The fact that there's really no threat in the game and you can just... I don't care. Doesn't, like, you don't think it would be better if there were some semblance of tension in the game? No. I mean, it's not really about that. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, more, a, it's more about being an art object and sort of... You know, letting you figure out where you need to go and how you need to deal with things without just making you repeat shit over and over again. And I do appreciate that to some degree. Um, it makes the puzzle solving a little less annoying when you're not having to jump the same up the same place. And there are plenty of places where I think if you're not really well versed in sort of the language of platformers that you would... Um, get stuck maybe not really know what it was trying to tell you to do uh -huh. you know like there's there's an element of like where you know i think because of i feel like this is made for not just you know people like us who play games all the time it's made for people who want to play something pretty and and something Different. that has a little i mean the metaphor is a little on the freaking nose yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a subtle game in terms of what it's trying to represent it's not like you're gonna have to dig for the themes right. on this one <laughs> It's a like, lot of people. Her name is Gray. She's trying to get away from a big black monster blob thing. She's bringing color back to the world and trying to reassemble a crying woman. I mean, it's like, come on. Well, like, a lot of people we know, we have compared this to uh, Journey. Yeah, there is some Journey to it for sure. You know, in the same way. What What ways um, do you feel like it's similar, and what ways do you feel like well, it's she's, not? Well, she's she's got the cape. Yeah. And uh, sort of the, the smock is, is the wordless sort of. You know, there's no dialogue. There's no you know words in the game. Oh, okay. Um, it's. Uh, you know, it's it's more about kind of getting from here to there and figuring out how to get from here to there. Although there's not as much figuring out in Journey. Right. Um, there are also little secrets, you know, secret things to find. Like you go through more difficult platforming sections to get to these little like kind of circles that like you you you, you see. And when you see when you get back to the the kind of the central hub, there's little symbols for each area and like they show like which ones are you know there's all the symbols have like there's a symbol for each circle thing and they're all lit up the ones you got. So I assume if you collect those all, something happens. I did not because I why you know you... <laughs> just watch the video on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, but it's fine. You know it's fine. I feel like I feel like there are points in this game where I just ran through stuff like that a less experienced player would kind of wonder why I knew to do that. Uh -huh. It's like but like there's that thing where like if you play enough platformers. You sort of understand the language. You you start of, to figure out the tells. Yeah, you yeah. know you know what what they're trying to tell you to do. You understand kind of what it's trying, like, hinting at you visually, um, and it's smart about stuff like that. You know, like, like so the the earliest use of like the smashing block thing is to smash, uh, like you know loose loose thing like rubble or floor so you can smash through them and get to a new area. Oh okay. Um, but early on. It does two things that I thought were smart. First, it drops you on one of the one of the, the smashable blocks before you get the ability. Mm -hmm. But you can see when you jump up and down on it, it's giving. It it rattles, and uh -huh. there's a thing you want. You know, there's a, one of those circle secrets is below it. You're like, uh -huh. how do I get down there? And then you go back. You know, the next screen you get the thing, like, and you go back. Oh, okay, I get it. Dots, yeah. And then as you are moving through the immediate after area, there are like little stacks of like little like kind of like. Um, little like like rocks and in in little tiny pits, bits of pot. It, looks, it almost looks like the, like the Blair Witch 
stick figure oh, okay. things. <laughs> and they rattle when you walk by, and if you, if you do the drop thing, they fall apart. So it teaches you that the, the brick thing can also smash stuff. And right, you do right. need to do that very shortly to let uh, red, the red birds out of various pots so you can get up further. Um, and here, here you see, uh, she, this is, she's adding blue. This is the third color, so she's adding. So blue. when you add a color, it adds it to the large woman first. It adds it, it to the entire spreads world. Spreads out to the rest of the world. Yeah, and that always uh, changes things. So like the blue will add water to, to various places that used to be um, impassable gaps, and uh -huh. now you can now you can get in the water and sort of swim paddle across over. or whatever. And you know, and that eventually, eventually, you do get the ability to swim, and um, then it almost turns into kind of an Echo the Dolphin sort of thing. Like there's a lot of. Swimming and platforming, like... Do you jump out of the water? Yeah, like, like oh. using, like, a, da like a, use like a dash to, like, jump out of the water, and then, like, there'll be, like, areas where, like, the gravity reverses, so you have to jump out of the water, reverse gravity, land in the next pile, like, puddle of water, and, like, jump back out and pick up a piece, a bunch of red birds and, like, leave them in midair when you jump, and then do a super jump back up through the gravity change into, the like, the upside-down water up there. Like, it gets pretty trippy. Um, I thought it was all fairly simple, but but pleasant. I think uh, less less experienced platform players might... Find it very, uh, find it a little more uh, complex to get through some of those sections. But I thought it, I thought it ramped nicely. It never really gets to crazy difficult realms, but it got to like satisfying. Realm. It was challenging. Yeah, it, it was, it was fine. It was fun. Here's the stuff you were yeah, talking was, about. Yeah, you're, yeah. Just, you're just burning through here. This, the animation's amazing. It really at is. All points. Yeah, I mean, I've been just sitting watching the monitor the whole time, even talking about yeah, it. It's it, a stunning game. And that's it's got a little bit of Abzu to it, in in the sense of just like looking at the world as part of the game uh -huh. and part of the appeal. Um, took me about three hours to finish, to finish the whole thing. thing. I did it. Yeah, I saw. It looked like it was pretty short. I did it in one sitting. It's uh, sixteen bucks. Um, I thought that was fine. Yeah. So much I pay for a two-hour movie. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if I'll ever play it again. Um, yeah, I guess that's the question. I, or is there anything there that would motivate you to well, do Well, unless that? you want to go back and get all the secret things. Right. Um, there is a chapter select that unlocks after you finish the game. Um, I could see myself going back and playing it like a year or two, like after I've forgotten most of it. I'd like, I'd like to see it again. You know, it's, it's, like a, it's like a nice you know, art book you take out every, every right. once in a while to look through. Can you recommend for any... I mean, even though you, you feel like it's a decent value for the time you're getting... Do you feel like you could recommend for someone to buy this right now? With, yeah, I would say with the I holidays would, here and all the big games out. I would think so. I mean, yeah. if, if it if you're looking at this and you think it's pretty and it strikes your interest, uh, you're not going to be disappointed. It's uh, you know, in terms of sort of the meaningful working working out uh, an emotional issue indie game subgenre, like it's one of the better entries in it. <laughs> We're so meta now. That's where we're at. We have, yeah. There's like a depression genre now. In Pretty much. I mean. games. <laughs> no, absolutely there is. It's funny. It's just the industry just is just going in all these weird directions. Yeah, at there's once. a lot of different takes you can have. I mean, I'd say, um, you know, the, the, what's the, the one I, the, the missing, is that it? Yeah. The, the pseudo, like where you, the girl rips her own arm off and you have to use that. So it's about similar things, but it's a very different tone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I, I'd say there's if they're finding different ways to play with, but it is like I think if this was in 3D, it would be described as a walking simulator. Yeah. Because you can't die. It's more about finding ways to progress than finding ways to defeat something. Right. Um, even though the overall ob objective is to defeat depression, at least temporarily. Um, and you know, the metaphor works. It's just a little heavy-handed in terms of like you know, they they certainly don't want you to miss what they're saying. Um, which is, you know, understandable in a game with no dialogue, but uh, some people might find that a little pretentious. I did not think it was that bad. I, didn't, I thought it was, a, it was, you know, if, if it didn't, if it didn't nail its visual look as well, maybe, like, it would fe come off a little more like that, but I think uh, because of how well they realize it visually, uh, like, they can get away with a little, uh, they can get away with it being a little on the nose. Yeah. It's like, I liked Journey. I had fun playing it. It's definitely longer than Journey. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, when I played Journey and I finished it, I was like, I, I don't understand why everyone's going, like, freaking out over this game. I like Journey. I didn't think it was the greatest thing I'd ever played. I, I'd say the same thing about this. You know, I know I've seen people talking about how they, they cried at the end of this game, and I did, okay, I mean, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People cry at the end of Terminator 2. That's cool. <laughs> <But> like, <laughs> 
it's uh, <laughs> it's fun. It's great. It's you know, it's a really pretty game that, that and if you look at the credits, like maybe like t- ten people made it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a it's a the artists on this game are really skilled. Yeah, it's a definitely definitely a a small time production that had an idea and had a vision, and I can't imagine they didn't nail that vision because. It looks like something that was plucked right out of somebody's imagination. It does. Um, now, this is available for all platforms? No, it's only on PC and and Switch right now. Right. So this is the first... Here you go. So this is the first game of that wave. Of, mm-hmm. I've talked about before about how it used to be every indie game was PC and PS4. PC, PS4. PS4 was always the first console that an indie came to. That is changing. Mm-hmm. It is now shifting to where it's PC and Switch first. And this is really kind of the first high-profile indie that does mm-hmm. that. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it came to other stuff later. Oh, yeah. But oh, for it sure. Definitely it's feels, definitely going to come to PS4 and Xbox Definitely One feels like, given the, the, the sales and attach ratio of quality indie stuff that hits the Nintendo eShop, uh, these, these devs knew where their bread was buttered. Yeah. And uh, I, have no, I have no doubt it's going to work out very well for them, because uh, uh, I, th- I think it'll stand out. Visually. Oh, it stands out no matter what. I mean, mm-hmm. it's one of those games you see once. So and yeah, you if, you, if you have a PC, uh, I mean, almost any PC should be able to run this. And uh, if you, or if you have a Switch, um, I would strongly recommend give, taking a look at it. Which version did you play? PC. Okay. Um, I'm glad I did because there's so many tiny details and like the scale changes so much that I feel like playing on a handheld might be a little tricky at times. But yeah. uh, it wouldn't be too bad. I mean, the the Switch is. Handheld screen is, is detailed, you know, it's it's high resolution enough that it should be fine. But uh, the other thing I would say is um, it's very musically based. Like, sound, the sound design is extremely good and extremely important to kind of, you know, setting the tone and, and helping you understand kind of what's happening. And there's, like, little visual, little, little audio cues that will help you in certain places understand what you're supposed to do. Um, so I would definitely play this with either headphones or a really nice like sound system definitely definitely crank the volume on this one because it's uh, it's part of the experience all right right on 16 dollars. 16 bucks yeah all right so there you go 16 bucks on pc and switch mm-hmm. and you would recommend it yeah let me know what you're getting but yeah. uh, it, it's uh, as these things go it's one of the best i've played wow impressive all right we're going to talk next about another indie game this one has been in the cooker for eight years uh, they announced it in 2013. At E3 2013, it was announced, but they had been working on it for a couple years Presumably, because their last thing was like 2011 or 2012 or something. Yeah. yeah. And so this game is called Below. Uh, Below, I think originally it was announced as an Xbox One exclusive. It was an Xbox One launch game. Right. Well, <laughs> it was supposed to be. It was be. supposed to be an Xbox One <laughs> launch exclusive. That obviously didn't work out. Um, and since then, with Microsoft's Play Anywhere initiative... It also is available for PC right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is like one of and those... they have hinted that there may be more platforms in the future. Yeah. Um, this is one of those games that's kind of been shrouded in mystery. They have not put out hardly any media for this game. They re- they've run real silent the last two years or so. They did a demo. At, there was a demo playable at E3, I think, ye- last year or the year before. Um, but this below has been... Lowe's one of those games where, like, there it was one of those games where people occasionally would seriously propose the idea that it was never coming out. Yeah, that it was. I think we may have proposed that a couple times. I never thought that would happen, but I, I just didn't know. Yeah, you know, it was one of those things where, like, I'm, I know people that like work in the same city as that place, work in the, you know, people have worked on the game periodically, and they're just like, we have no idea. You know, that, that game's like. Every single time, it seemed like going back to the drawing board to like figure out to add some new thing or like there was some new new idea or whatever. It was like, you know, the game has gone through a lot of permutations. Well, they completely even, vi- even visually, you can see like you know back in the in the early days uh, after it was announced, it had more of like a voxel sort of look yeah, and feel. It did, yeah. And the the final release has a lot more detail in the fine in the fine areas now. So. I was surprised by this game, so I didn't know a ton about Below before I played it, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. Um, again, and, because it's one of those games that's kind of shrouded in mystery. I think there's literally, and before like the last couple weeks, there were two trailers for this game. Total. Mm-hmm. Total. Since it, they first announced it. And so, whether intentionally or intentionally, I did not know a lot about this game. Uh, so I was pretty surprised. I think surprised. that was intentional. I think they were... Maybe... Given that, especially how it's presented when you play it, yeah, it feels like they want you to sort of discover it as you go. So I was pretty surprised to find out what it was. So 
the game begins and it starts with this really long shot. Yes. Uh, it the screen's pretty much black and gray for the first like minute and a half or two minutes. Yeah, it's a then, long. Then you start to see some clouds. And then you see this little speck in the middle of the screen, and slowly that little speck gets bigger and bigger and bigger till you find out that it's a ship sailing on the ocean. Then the camera follows the ship. It comes ashore on a beach. Mm-hmm. Your character gets off the boat, and the game starts. And you have there's no dialogue. There's no tutorial. Nope. There's no instructions. They just plop you down on the beach, and they're like, basically, figure it out. Yep. And figure it out I did. <laughs> I, again, I knew very little about this game coming into it, so I was shocked to learn that it is one of those games where when you die, you go back to the beginning. So, mm. It's a roguelike. It's a roguelike. So basically the goal is how far can you get each time, I guess? Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I generally do not like games like that at all. Uh, it's it's a survival game as well. Mm-hmm. So you're maintaining food and drink at all times. They tend to go and down temperature and temperature. They tend to go down very quickly, particularly. Yeah, you the get food. hungry real fast. Like yeah. this, this dude's got some kind of metabolism problem or something. Yep. And so man is eating turnips like no tomorrow. Yeah. And so you land on the beach. You rummage around the beach. There's a campfire there. Mm-hmm. You light the campfire. I still have not figured out exactly what the campfires do. Other than the fact that you can craft at them. Yeah, I, I think they warm you up uh, if you're in a cold area. And also, I think they save. Do I they? Think I think it's a save point, or maybe not. I don't but, know. I guess, I guess I'll find out when I turn the game on again. Yeah. Because I... So, I did have one point where it appeared like it did save a checkpoint, but then all the other times when I died, it just threw me back to the beach again. Yeah, I haven't died yet, so I, don't, I haven't seen that part happen yet. Well, if you haven't died yet, is it on pause right now, or did you shut it down? Yeah, it'll probably is shut down by now. Okay, interesting. We'll see, we'll see what it looks I wonder looks what will like. happen whenever know. you go to boot it back up. For me, I would die, and it would just cut to the beach, and the ship would roll up, and a different character would get mm-hmm. out, and you just start all over again. And like Dark Souls, it's then your job to go and find your corpse and collect all your stuff again. Mm-hmm. And the game, for me, became this cycle of die, go back to the beach, make it an extra two screens, die, go back to the beach, again, come all the way. And you have to go through all the crap again. You have to climb up all the walls and go down the long staircases. And I don't know. It It looks like, uh, from what I poked around with, it looks like there are shortcuts to open up to get back to places faster eventually. Probably. Um, certainly, like there's a in the, near the first campfire, you go in like a little hole there, yeah. and there's like a little there's like the a bridge, bridge yeah. that you can't get to because it's like held up by one rope. You need to shoot the and rope like, so, with so the clearly bow. you can you'll be able to create something there. Yeah, I tried shooting it with a bow and I couldn't. It wouldn't hit let me anything. shoot it either. Yeah. So I think you need to come back from the other side and cut it with a That's sword. That's possible too. And then yeah. that'll let you get back to that first campfire. And then when if you die, you can come back and go straight up that, and that'll get. Because I think. There's a lot of Dark Souls uh, influence there here, is. and I'm sure, that, I'm sure that's part of it. Um, the enemies in the game will kill you in just a couple hits. Uh, so you can't go all willy-nilly with the sword and just mm-hmm. run in with, you know, and just... Although they are afraid of fire. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Um, there's a lot of elements you discover sort of just by trying it. By accident, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of trial and error. The, uh, the graphics in the game... It's so, and this, and it actually, this is one of the things that delayed this game, mm-hmm. is that they had to completely rewrite the graphics engine because they were insistent on the fact that the camera is pulled so far back. Um, and they were having problems with the engine running because it was, I don't know how you can't have an engine that can't draw that many polys on screen, but apparently theirs can't. So they had to go back and rework the graphics engine so that they could use that far out camera view the way that they originally intended. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about the camera angle, the camera view in this? It's fine. Like it doesn't. You don't find yourself squinting trying to see. No, I mean I I can't. I, I maybe squint to see like details on like the character, but I, I, I know where he is. I know what I'm. You know they they do code everything so that you can tell. You know like a an item is a flashing white light, and your guy always is in the middle with the. With the you know the lantern or the shield, uh, if it's, something's going to come at you, it's got a it's a big it's a glowing red thing. You know, like 
it, it they they get it across. The one thing I will say is, um, if they ever make this for the Switch, forget it. I that's not going to be a handheld mode game. Well, actually, Matt, I don't know if you know or not, but there is a special edition of this game, and if you spend a little extra money, you get this promotional item that comes with it. Uh, Sam, can you bring that up real quick? I got an image of it there. There it is. Mm. <laughs> Could be handy on the Switch. <laughs> yep. So you spend an extra 10 bucks, they give you a magnifying glass so you can actually see your freaking character. <laughs> uh, my biggest problem with the visuals, I, I'm not a fan of the way pulled back thing, to mm -hmm. be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I don't like that I can't really see anything. And the way the game works is it's the, the initial stage is it's really freaking dark. And when you come into a room, there's a fog of war there. And as you make your way through the room, the fog pulls back and you can eventually see the whole level. So not only is it really dark and is it hard to see like what's on the ground or what's going around, you also have this fog that keeps you from seeing stuff. So in this game, you tend to just stumble onto stuff. Like you'll stumble into an enemy and get hit like out of nowhere. You won't see him first. Um, you'll stumble into other hazards that you, you can't see coming. And so everything being so small, your chances of seeing those hazards is like zero. It's like nil. And... The last couple times I played it before I gave up, I had made it farther than I ever had, and there are plants on the ground where if you step on them, you die instantly. It's like a Venus flytrap-like thing hmm. that just basically chomps you and you die. And so it happened the first time, I'm like, oh, that's dirty. So send me back to the beach. I go all the way through the level again. I get there. I'm like, oh, there's that plant. I'm not going to step on it this time. I go into the next room, step on a plant and die. And that is where I got, I was over the edge. I'm like, this is... This isn't for me. I don't enjoy playing games where I feel like, again, I talk about this all the time, they're not respectful of the player. It's like you don't put a plant, an insta-death plant, that you can hardly see on the ground in a game like this. At least, in my opinion, that's, that's not smart design. I mean, that's roguelikes. It is. That's... And again, that's probably why I don't resonate with the genre at all. Mm -hmm. The other problem I've had with this game visually, other than the camera being pulled way out, is... The way the lighting works in the game, I cannot, I have no depth perception in this game. <laughs> so I can't tell if something is a wall that I have to climb up or if it's a pathway that's going in between like two boulders or something. Like I can't judge the depth. And there's like, there's a lot of points in this game. Again, it's really dark. Everything's pulled back. It's hard to see the detail where you have to find like this little sliver of a path that will get you to where you need to go. And to me, a lot of this stuff is works against finding things like that and seeing and recognizing those visual elements of the game. So I love the art style. I like that they're trying to leave the character a mystery because ultimately the character is disposable and it doesn't really matter what the character looks like because another one's going to roll in as soon as you die anyway. And I like the aesthetic of it, but for practicality reasons, when you're actually trying to play the game, it actually kind of drove me bonkers. Um, and again, I'm not a big fan of roguelites. I know a lot of people are. I'm not. Um, I don't think I'm going to continue playing this. Mm. How are you feeling? You, I don't think you've played it as much as I no, have. No, I'm not. I'm like maybe an hour into it. It's and, and But how do you even describe... I mean, you've played it for an hour? Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't died yet, so I, that's all progress. Yeah, I guess you're right. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand a lot of it yet. Like, I don't under you know, you, early on you pick up the little little glowing thing, and that's what lets you open the door that gets you into the yeah, first Yeah, we didn't really talk about area. that stuff, yeah. Because, like, you got to figure out kind of, but and I, I'm so not... So you have, like, a lantern that has special yeah. abilities. The first, the first ability you get for the lantern, it shines a light that will open doors, basically. That's how you yeah. get into but, the first temple. But it uses up, like, a, like a thing in the a lantern. currency, yeah. Which, that you early get, on, you just get from this little pedestal, but so later you can, you can get it from watch. killing enemies. As you kill these enemies, they'll drop, like, a white pellet on the ground. Yeah. And then those white pellets are used to power the lantern. Yeah. And, and then, I'm like, assuming, eventually, the lantern gets other abilities. Probably. I mean, there's also, like, a... It, it, as an example of sort of how uh, how this game is kind of set up to either challenge or irritate you, depending on your perspective. So, yeah, when you kill an enemy, it drops one of the little glowing, you know, currency things. Yeah. Um, but you and, and, you know, they'll come at you. They'll come at you. They'll they charge you. Oh, yeah. the, the, at least the early guys, you know, red, red bull monster shadow dog things 
like or whatever they are. I can't see. What you they can't are, tell what they are. <laughs> I think that's part of the point. They're just a red but orb. Like, yeah. The red orb surrounded by black sh- like smoke almost. Yeah. And uh, but you can pull out the lantern and that'll like make them run away. Yeah. But they run away to the edge of the edge of the, the the ground. And if you kill them at the edge of the ground, the thing they drop falls off the edge. Yeah. They don't and always you don't get it. Yeah, it's not like a lot of games where the drops are yeah. programmed to make sure they stay at a place. No, where you it's can very get intentional. So so yeah. it's like. So you have to kind of balance that risk reward where like you can use the the lantern to get them off you but you're going to lose you, you're going to lose this up. So you got to figure out a way to either lure them in or like I was I was like turning it off and then turning it back on and then chasing them down with the with the sprint button and then like doing like a <laughs> like a like a jump slash right, at them right. almost to try yeah. like it, it was it was in it's an interesting like kind of balance mechanic. I still don't really know what you do with them i mean i i see like when i use the lantern and i shine the light it like shows it like one of them's flashing red and i lost like a, you know it, i used up some lantern ammo or whatever and you can also use it to like if you go the last thing i did like was uh one of the campfires i found i had enough currency to uh to pick the item it was, it was an icon next to the campfire that just had that currency thing and said whatever this much and i hit it and the campfire turned blue and the song changed and i have no idea what it did i don't know what it did i didn't even do that so so, um, i have no idea if what had happened so i'm I'm kind of intrigued by um it's a mysterious yeah i'm intrigued by kind of what i'm trying to do what i'm trying to figure out here but i can see getting bored real fast if like it hits a point where I just don't know. I'm not figuring out what everything's doing, and I'm just doing this. Hey, I die and keep having to do the same thing over. That's over what again. I've done. I, I, I mean, I've played the same section of the game like ten times. It was also a uh, uh, one of my one of my other friends stopped by right as I was starting it, and uh, I was like, he's like, oh, how is it? And I was like, well, I, I hit start like five seconds before you rang the doorbell, and and. Uh, He's like, oh, let's see. And so we watch it. And we watch that cut scene. That opening scene. Like two minute long (laughs) slow zoom. And like maybe 90 seconds into that, he's like, you know what? Like, just tell me later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Like this. It is not is not does not grab you from the from the start, really. I will tell you one thing that does grab me in this game, though, and that is the sound. Yeah, the, the sound is very good. The soundtrack, the sound design is absolutely amazing. It's not synth wave because there's really no beats in it. It's just kind of this ambient, like, synth stabs and synth strings. It's very, very moody, very foreboding. I was playing this, like you were talking earlier about playing Grease with headphones. I've been playing this with headphones. And there was a tone in the game that made me disoriented. Hmm. I had it turned up really loud because, the, again, the sound in this game is absolutely incredible. And, and there was a point where this tone just, like, sustained and literally, it disoriented me. I had to take the headphones off and put them in my lap and, like, give myself a couple seconds. Um, the sound in this game is incredible. Uh, again, much like Grease, there's no voice acting. Um, there's no voice in this at all. Character is just nameless, faceless, disposable. Um, I got attached to my character, the first character I had, and then he died, and I realized I got a completely new one, and I just didn't even care. Um, so you can see Very why... Infinity Blade. yeah. So you can see why they've made the decisions that they've made. That doesn't necessarily mean that I actually enjoy the game that much, though. Um, I can see a certain segment of players adoring this game, though. Like, if you're into Rogue... Like, I'll put it to you this way. The rest of this game is interesting enough that a genre that I typically do not like at all, I'm willing to give this a chance because Mm. the other parts of it are so much more interesting to me than typical games in this genre uh it seems to be very polished presentation it's razor sharp they had a they had an idea and they nailed it and they stick to it and they don't deviate uh and the problem with games like that is either you like it or you don't and if you do like it that's great and if you don't there's nothing that's going to change your mind ultimately so Mm -hmm. um i don't think i'm going to keep playing this but i'll say this i've already played it more than probably any other roguelike ever so that's probably a, a feather in its cap. Also, uh, props for sticking with that title because wow, is that easy to turn into a derogatory article title? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Below average, below, below expectations. <laughs> this game belows. Belows. Like it's, <laughs> they had some confidence. Well, it definitely does not below. No. Uh, it's just not the style of game that I really like. But there's a lot of people out there who love this genre, and I think they are going to love below. Yeah, I think I think 
certainly there's very little else like it. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly, and um, I don't know. It's it's hard to really come to a conclusion on it just because I've played so little of it. But uh, it it it's neat. That's like, the way to describe like, it. Actually, that is a really good adjective to use to describe this game. It's neat. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. At first, when the game started, I thought the game had, like, crashed. I literally was like, okay, like, there's something wrong. Like, the... Because it starts out, it's literally just, like, black and gray on the screen for, like, a minute. And I'm Mm. like... And there's music playing. And I'm like, well, maybe if the music's still playing, that means it hasn't crashed. And then slowly, it starts revealing everything. And then that goes on for another, like, four minutes. (laughs) Yeah. Walling that little ship to the shore. It's a, it's a long shot. It's um, yeah. it's like something. But it makes of, it different. It's like something out of Solaris. It is. Like, it's yeah. just, it's like yes, I get it. Thank you. Yeah. It's uh. It. But again, it's one of those things that makes it different from a lot of other games. Yeah. And I think that'll make it appeal to a lot of people where maybe watching it they aren't getting that. Yeah. This is not. I mean, you you, you power up the patience batteries before you yep. load this game. Like Absolutely. It's not. Uh, it's not. Like, oh, we're going to get quick, quick fix of video gaming. It's like no, no it's not. No, 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 no. This, You're going to die. This game wants you to engage, and it wants you to pay attention, and it wants you to concentrate. It's, um, you know, and that is also kind of a Dark Souls. It is. You know, it's like a, you know, in in the arguments over uh, over the Dark Souls stuff this week on Twitter, I was I was like, you know, I don't I, I don't want to be that guy, but like I don't think Dark Souls is really all that hard. I think the diffi- every time I stop playing Dark Souls for the night, it's not because I'm sick of the difficulty; it's because I'm tired of concentrating. Yeah, like you have to pay a lot. You of have attention. to pay attention. You have yeah. to you have to be present doing it. You know, that's why I think a lot of people like it because it's almost like meditation. You know, like you get in that zone. You have to you, focus, yeah. And you have to fo- you focus on it. And you 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 know you, you have your good nights and your bad nights. And sometimes I'm just like I can't focus. I can't. I can't focus enough. hard enough to to beat this boss right now. I know that. I'm just gonna stop here and come back later. Yeah. Um. And below seems like it might have that same sort of thing going on. You definitely need to concentrate because, like I said, there's insta death stuff in the game mm-hmm. where literally you just step one step the wrong direction and you die. Yep. And then when you come back, you have to remember where that spot was. And there is like an audio cue, like that in particular. There's like a growl that you hear. I didn't notice it at all the first time. I only noticed it the second time afterwards. Mm. After I died, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I just heard a noise. And then I came back the third time and I got near it and I could hear it. And I was like, okay, I'm not going anywhere near there. And that's kind of how this game works. Like Mm. each iteration teaches you something new that you then apply on your next run. And again, I think that's a lot like Dark Souls. It's like one of those games where you kind of have to fail to learn how to not fail. Mm-hmm. And uh, Below, to me, is very much like that. So yeah. it's like, it's kind of a cross between Dark Souls and Breath of the Wild. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Because uh, all I, the survival stuff from Breath of the yeah, Wild I, I think... and kind of the art style of Breath of the Wild mixed with kind of the... Mm-hmm. I think there's I think there's definitely influence from both of those things in this game. Yeah. Um, and it, it, influence from Breath of the Wild would definitely indicate why I got delayed again. Yep. Because <laughs> that was recent. That was that was a recent game. Yeah. Um, well, not too recent. That's almost two years old now. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It will be. Yeah, in March. It'll be wow. two years old. Wow, that's crazy to think about. Hard to believe. But yeah, I mean, and I think if you like those elements of Breath of the Wild, or you like those elements of the Souls franchise, I think you're going to love this game. Yeah, I think it's an inter- it's, it's interesting that this is out at the same time or a week apart from Ashen, yeah. which is a much more straightforward Souls-like, yeah. um, where they're both sort of kind of going for similar ideas and similar takes on you know where you can bring the material that Dark Souls sort of lays down. But like Ashen is sort of taking it and doing it similarly but with different art style like like there's a lot more dark souls to it whereas be- below um is taking the lessons of you know kind of the, the style of dark souls sort of very um mindful and purposeful design and putting a very different spin on it um it also reminds me a little bit of uh, darkest dungeon just yeah, just in the analogy. tone yeah um not in the sense that like but in the sense of like you have to adjust to the idea that part of the game is throwing yourself against this thing yeah over and over and over and accepting that that's the way it is that's how yeah that's yeah. how it goes and that's part of the game you know yeah. so it's like it's like in this it's it, you know you can't quit these games when you die because that would be like quitting super mario brothers because when you jump right 
It's it's literally <laughs> a function of the character. It is, yeah, absolutely. So, um, as long as you're ready for that, and you have a pretty big TV or a pretty big monitor, because also it's also on Steam. I was playing um, this on a monitor, on a 23 inch monitor, sitting about three feet away from the monitor, and uh, every other game that's it's more than big enough to play. And on this one, mm-hmm. I was like squinting like looking at the screen. I feel like that's something that will get better as you get accustomed to the game's kind of language. So. Probably. Yeah. Similar like to what I was saying about Greece. Where or you like, just buy the collector's edition and get the magnifying glass. Yeah, it's not a real thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess I wear. didn't mention that. No, that's not real. <laughs> I made that. Is, that. that is Shane's own hilarious <laughs> joke for the show. <laughs> yeah, I made that. I, I didn't even tell him it was, fa- it was fake. They probably yeah. figured that out already. Yeah, I think they did. <laughs> Yeah, that's totally fake. I, I photoshopped Although, if they image. ever put a physical co- version out, yeah. they, they might want to give you a call. <laughs> I already got the spec ready to go. Yeah. You, have to, you make it something that just sort of snaps on the front of the Switch. <laughs> like, they used to have those for uh, the, for the Game Boy. GBA. Yep. They had these weird, like, magnifying things that oh, would yeah. come up off the system. Like, yep. you they probably had, need that for this. They had those for, all, like, the Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, game, all those things, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this game's only for PC and Xbox, and it's going to stay that way. This is not going to come to other platforms. I don't no, think. they they hinted that it really? might they might come to other stuff later. When interesting, yeah, there, there, there was I think it was somebody I, I don't remember if it was Nathan Vella himself, but it was somebody from from Cappy was saying like saying like yeah we'll, we'll talk about that later sort of thing. Interesting. Um, how much is this game? I did, they sent it to me, so I didn't uh, twenty five. Twenty five. That I seems think. good. That's a good price for that game. I don't know if it's 25 because it's 25, or I don't know if I got it for 25 because it's part of that Winter of Arcade thing where oh. if you buy more than one, you get five bucks off. A lot of times, too, when you so buy new games, they'll be cheaper, and then like three weeks later, yeah, they actually so, But go when, I, when I bought it, it was 25. Maybe it's 29.99 if you aren't doing, getting that deal. I don't, I don't know if that automatically does that when you see it or when it does yeah. it with the price. I don't know. But it's either 25 or 29 or, 20, or 30. And I would be okay, I think, with either one of those prices. Yeah, it's about right. Like, it's... You know, thirty is maybe a little steep for kind of what you would think of this, but like you can you can feel the production value oh, of yeah. it from the you beginning. You can tell that this game has been in development for at least five years. Yeah, absolutely. And like active development, not just right, like, right, not, 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 like, not just like oh, we don't know, like we ran out yeah. of money. It's like no, this is this, this feels like a game that people worked on and worked on and worked on and worked and on fine-tuned and fine tuned. Yeah, because you have to start thinking. Okay, well. I can't even imagine the numbers that they have to run when they start thinking about, okay, what resources are we going to make possible for the player to get? Mm-hmm. What percentage of those resources is the player actually going to get? And then you, you have to extrapolate that out to make sure, okay, well, typically how long does it take for a player to get hungry before they need food? Or how long, at what point in the game are they going to need the next torch? Mm-hmm. And do we, do we make sure we get them enough wood and enough sparks so that they can make... All that stuff. I would never, ever want to make a game yeah. like that. It's like, it also feels good. It play. does. It feels the combat nice. feels good. Yeah. So there's there's sword slashing, there's blocking, uh, there's a bow and arrow. I used all my arrows right at the beginning because I didn't realize that it was equipped, and I just mm. went to attack with my sword, and it just fired like all four of my arrows really fast. But you give you, they give you enough stuff to craft arrows pretty, pretty yeah, well. They do. I mean, yeah, they it's, it's all there once you figure it out, how, out how it all works. Yeah. So... So I guess I would say this. I enjoyed this game, and it's a genre that I hate. Hmm. Will I continue playing it? Probably not. And Matt, you're probably a little more open to these types of games. Do you think you're going to keep trudging yeah, forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll at least give it a few more hours to see what I think. I think like, there's there's mystery in this game. Like uh, Deep in my mind, in my heart, I know that there's probably something really cool waiting at the end of this thing. Like, I, I feel like at a certain point, the game is going to change and do something different, or it's going to crack open. Um, I don't know. I haven't got there. It's just, I just have a feeling that that's mm. the way it is. That eventually you get to some point where things change in some way, shape, or form. Or at the very least, eventually you're going to, everything's going to be explained. Because you don't know anything about this. It starts, you're on a boat, you land on the shore, that's it. That's all you know. You don't know where you're traveling to. You don't know if you came to this location intentionally. Well, I mean, you, or... know, you know where you're going. Meaning? Below. Right. <laughs> going down. And you do. You go down, down, down. Uh, there's not many stairways up in this game. No. It's, you just keep going deeper and deeper below the ground. So, um, again, I'm not a big fan of this genre, but I've actually enjoyed my time with it. And Matt, I think you've just generally enjoyed it. Yeah. 
good. I mean, I don't I don't know enough to really say tremendously one way or the other, but it's yeah. a, it's a good first impression once you get past the two minute opening cutscene. I have a feeling that for our game of the year discussion for best indie game on Tuesday, maybe we'll resurface because both of us. Maybe I'll go back and play a little more. Um, no reviews out for this at all yet. No, this doesn't seem to be a lot of... There's some impressions, but yeah. I haven't seen any scored reviews yet. Which, again, leads me to believe that there's a lot below the surface in this game. Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing that probably a lot of the other editors have played it a lot more than I have, and they still haven't written their reviews for it. So um, there's still some mystery behind this game beyond about what we spoke about. And it has been in development for a long time, which would generally lead you to believe that there's some, some things mm -hmm. underneath the, the surface there. So we'll see. Uh, but for now, I think a lot of it depends on whether you're into those types of games. And I think if you are, you should buy it. And if you're not, you may want to wait till you hear me talk about it again. <laughs> yeah, you might, might want to go look for that Devil May Cry 5 demo. Again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of the opposite versions of everything. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. We're going to talk next about Beyond Good and Evil 2. Uh, we spoke about this game probably 10 months ago, the last time it yeah. was on the show. Because they put up like a live stream that was just basically showing the engine mm. and like some of the ships and things like that. E3 and the E3 before that, and then like ten years before that. Right. Like, well, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about this game literally for like ten years. Um, but what we year was that? One, that one trailer. The CG one. The CG one where Paige, Paige on inhales the, the inhales the bug. Oh. What was that like? Was that like 08? 08. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think it was two thousand eight. Yeah. And it just vanished ago. until like two years ago. Yeah. And then the last time we talked about it, they finally showed in-engine footage. And it was mm -hmm. just all like pre-alpha, just like, hey, here's a ship. Hey, our jetpacks work now. Well, this week they showed the game. Mm -hmm. They finally showed what Beyond Good and Evil 2 is. Um, they put out a trailer that we're seeing right now. And they did a live stream that had literally, I don't know, like 30 or 40 minutes about of, 30 minutes, of yeah. gameplay. Literally the game being played in the state that it's going to be played when we finally get our hands on it. Um, so I have notes I'm going to run through based upon the stuff that I experienced and watched. Uh, first of all, it's a seamless open world. Did we know that already? Did we yeah. know that it was like a No Man's Sky? Like, yeah. can be on the ground, jump in a ship, and fly all the way to outer space? Yeah, they, they said that at okay. E3, but I mean, they didn't show it really. But they said that that was the idea. So it is a seamless, completely seamless, not just open world, open galaxy. Well, open solar system. Open solar system. Yeah. It doesn't look like you leave the star system you're in. Yeah, so it's not it's not No Man's Sky big. No, but it's... Honestly, it's like... I feel like Starlink was it like is. a dry run for this or something. Like Starlink, like <laughs> yeah. the tech is a, the tech seems very similar. It does. Uh, Starlink isn't doing the more impressive tech tricks this is doing. Where yeah. like they're talking about like when you pull out from like you know if you're in orbit and you were like scan you like zoom in on on the city, the traffic's still running. Like yeah. your friend and co-op can still be in the city doing stuff, and you're up in space, and it's all still running in the same game. Starlink doesn't do that. No, no, no. Uh, the day-night cycle for all the planets in the solar system are... There isn't anything programmed. It's just how they rotate as they're going around the star. Yeah. Um, it's Which is a thing that, like... It, that's, a, that's a sticking point on No Man's Sky, because the planets don't rotate. There's no... There's no specific star. Like the the star you're in in a solar system in No Man's Sky is just a text. It's a light source on a texture. Right. Whereas this, like, they're fully modeling the solar system, and it's always in motion and always happening, um, which it seems which Starlink is not doing. Starlink is a fixed solar system map. Yeah. That clearly that is kind of sort of the next level stuff they're doing for this game. But I would be shocked if Starlink was not some kind of like oh yeah tech prototype test, absolutely test bed thing. I mean, if you think about it, Starlink is. Similar to this in a lot of other ways, too. Like, your home base is out in space. Yeah, you have a, you have a home, like, main, larger ship. Like yeah. a frigate out in outer space that you have to travel yeah. out to outer space to get to. And you go there and you do all your upgrades and all your stuff like you normally do in mm -hmm. today's modern action RPG in a lot of ways. I can't figure out if this is an action RPG or if it's just an action adventure. It seems to be straddling the line because the game has augments. Yeah. That you can attach to pretty much everything. Your if ships, If you... there ain't XP and levels, it ain't an action RPG to me. No, you're right. So... That, kind of, that does tend to be the, the break point, and it does not appear that this game has that. Not so far, but they said there seems to be... A, there's a lot of augments to use, and like you're, you're going to be able to use the augments to customize the character, to, to you know, and the augments will stack 
Like if you you know you can freeze a guy and then hit him with a float thing and then hit him with a you know a force thing that knocks him over and like um, so there there is an element of like you know you set up your character or your space captain they keep calling you yeah uh, in the demo like you set up your character to kind of like you know you pick your arguments to sort of complement each other or complement your co-op partner um, however you like like there's a, there's a scene where they show um, like the two the two players like one comes into the, the 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 room that they have to kill all the enemies in one comes in on top. And one comes in like low, and the one on top sort of scans everybody. And yes, yeah, so you have a spyglass. Yeah, and, and the spyglass does a ton of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of scanning, which you, so you know. I'm you know, happy. you love that. <laughs> I saw and, that. And uh, I was like, oh, Matt's yeah. all over that. You can scan everything from from a scientist to a city. It's great. You get a little you extra can, details you can and stuff. Scan enemies. Yeah. And it will tell you what augments they have, so you yep. know how to equip yourself before you go into battle, it'll, or if you just should avoid the battle altogether. It'll note which ones are more dangerous. Right. Um, and you also recruit NPCs yeah, to your so team you, in this. So if you see uh, they're working on these, hi- these animal hybrids there, the one in the lower left is not dead. And they say, that, you know, they don't show it because it's not really in place yet. But they say, you know, you scan the, the struggling ape man who's trying to, like, get off the table... And um, it says he's a mechanic, and like if you wanted to, you could recruit him to be a mechanic on your ship. So yeah. like you're, they're talk. So they, they kept talking about how there's like there's like three pillars to the on foot stuff. There's the jetpack, there's the melee weapon, and there's the gun. Yep. And so sword, jetpack, and gun. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, you know, using your your augments will change how your how those things work for you. Uh, and they want you to be able to use all of them in conjunction and all, you know, using the jetpack to go up high so you can do a smash attack with your sword or like snipe people from up top and that kind of thing. And then the other trinity they talked about was when you're in space and you've got your, you've got your captain and their abilities as a captain, you've got your ship and you've got your crew. Yeah. So those are your three main things you're, you're modifying for the, so the macro, you know, space stuff. And uh, it looks like a whole lot of it's there. And in place, I mean, it looks like and, it's coming out next year to me. Well, they said there's going to be a, an open, like an open beta, late 2019. So um, either 20. 20- it's an open beta. It's either coming out either at the tw- end of next year or the yeah, first. Yeah, it's either like one of those like real close to the launch, so we can get the multiplayer stuff ironed out, or it's like. Q1 2020. Yeah. So that sounds it sounds like that to me. As Matt mentioned, there's co-op. It's drop in, drop out at any time. Yeah. You don't have to stay near everybody else. You can, nope. as Matt said, you can be in space and your other co-op partner can be down on the ground. Yeah, and they show the end of the demo in the in the big long live stream is uh, the one character is standing on her ship outside of the, the home, the mothership thing, and the other guy just gets in his ship and just flies away. Like, leaves the planet. Like, yep. goes to the other side of the solar system. And, like, you can still see them. They're still there. They're still yeah. in the game. Everything's still moving. You know? And your spyglass, you can actually zoom in down onto yeah. each city and see the, everything happening. Like, yep. everything is still going and on. A, and there's a lot of stuff. You know, there's, there's, you know the, you, they zoom out on the planet. And there's all little points of interest, like your standard Ubisoft open world. And you, they'll show the other side of the planet. The, the I think New India is the name of the planet. Um, and you look at the other side. And um, it's all like bombarded by. Uh, it's actually a moon. Actually, it's a, it's the moon around one of the gas giants, and the the other side is full has like all these you know asteroid craters where like you know it's just bombarded by by stuff all the time, and uh, there's no settlements on that side because you can't put a city somewhere it's going to get hit by an asteroid. <laughs> but it's full of minerals and st- valuable. They, they said there's going to be stuff to explore and find and dig around with like on the other side, but it's going to be a dangerous place because you're going to be in a place where there's constant asteroid strikes interesting um, like falling everywhere <laughs> so, you're, crazy. so you're gonna like there's gonna be like rich rewards but you're also gonna have to be in a very hazardous zone now uh, you can pick up you can commandeer any vehicle in the game yeah. anything you find around you can jump in and you can drive it uh, you also have your own vehicles that you actually own and you can upgrade those with augments and all this other stuff so there's kind of that building element to it and do all that like they showed the, yeah, the there's mo- cosmetics they showed and... the mothership and it was they they intentionally had repainted it to look like the mothership that's in the CG trailer from E3 yeah um, so your ship doesn't have to look like that ship but you can make it look like that ship if you want to um, the combat now I've not experienced it I've not had the controller in my hands but at this point in my career I feel like I've gotten pretty good at watching combat in a video game mm-hmm. and being able to tell whether it seems to be good. The combat in this game right now does not look good to me. It looks a little mushy. It looks, me. yeah, you look detached. It doesn't look like it has a lot of impact or oomph. Mm-hmm. 
behind it, and uh, that's stuff that can all be tweaked. I mean, they have yeah, that's, of that's time. a later thing. Like this is this is you're in real serious pre-alpha proof of concept like realm here. Um, but I would be very surprised if they didn't tweak the hell out of that, just in the sense that a Ubisoft melee combat generally feels pretty darn good, and in the first Beyond Good and Evil, the melee combat was great. Like, yeah. it, like it really it felt was, good. Yeah. So I'm, and you they, you're whacking stuff with a stick most yeah. of the time. <laughs> I mean, but they they very intentionally call out in the demo that like. You know, we want to we want to nail that melee combat feel from the first game. So uh, hopefully they get there. There's a bunch of other elements of this that makes it feel like uh, Grand Theft Auto, thus the lower third for this topic. Um, there's a police presence and like mm -hmm. a warning level. Um, if you commit a ton of crimes, the police are going to come after you. You're going to have to shake them. Uh, there's radio stations mm -hmm. in the you game. You are a pirate. After yeah, all. you are a pirate. There's radio stations, just like in Grand Theft mm -hmm. Auto. Um, there's all kinds of little elements like that that kind of sink it more, I think, more directly mm -hmm. into the action adventure genre in a lot of ways. And they they also talked about a thing like when they show the, the they show the the girl first, and then they drop the co-op other player in. Yeah. And the other player is a is a ape hybrid, yep. ape human hybrid, and they talk about like they talk about like mixing the DNA to get like a certain look to the character. And it sounded like what they're t saying is like when you create your character, you're going to be able to mix animal and human DNA to kind of create like a unique looking hybrid furry kind of thing. DNA like, appears to be a big yeah. thing in this game. Every, like everyone you scan, earlier, yeah, everyone you scan shows, you shows DNA. DNA strain is. Yeah. I, I, look, I guarantee there's tons of mystery still left behind this game. Um, but what I've seen so far sold, I am in yeah. on this game. Uh, the jetpack, you can fly anywhere any at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a lot of freedom in this game to pretty much do whatever the heck you want. As you can see, dogfighting is a big part of the game. Um, as you augment your ship, you get healing missiles. Yeah, you can do that. So if somebody is on your team and they're getting beaten up, you can shoot their ship with your healing missile and heal their ship. I think that's a pretty cool concept. Yeah, that's uh, uh, I remember that from Borderlands. Borderlands has something like that. Does it? Healing grenades and and uh, there was a you could get like if you had a, an ability as one of the classes was like it turned their your gun into a healing gun. If you shot your allies, it would heal them instead of kill, hurt them. Um, that's a that's a fun way to kind of like add a healing element without adding a whole new system. Absolutely, like so, just uh, let them sh let's just shoot a, shoot them with a gun. Yeah, and heal. shoot a bad guy, it hurts him. <laughs> shoot a good guy, it helps him. Like that's great. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else, what other nice fly flyby of the Ganesha statue here. There's a the 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 most and they yeah the most impressive thing so far is like the the close up detail versus like the macro the size like the, <laughs> the fact that you can be that close to that statue's eye and then like it two minutes later good. you're in space it's and like pretty impressive and, yeah. and all the stuff's still moving and the planet's still rotating and everything it's it's great like it's you know this is uh this is uh i mean i love space stuff and that kind of like seamless transitional stuff anyway which is one of the reasons i like no man's sky but yeah this is another dream game basically something that plays good on the ground you explore weird temples and hidden things and run around a city and then you can fly up you know it's great if, if they actually pull this all off it'll be amazing yeah i feel like this is a good compromise for maybe people who tried no man's sky and they were like oh it's too mm -hmm. much for me this is a nice little middle ground. Where yeah, well, this is a good kind of like, I mean, it feels like a lot of this is going to be pretty handcrafted. Yeah. You know, it's it's big and it's huge and there's going to be obviously, obviously nobody handcrafted this whole planet, but it feels like there's going to be a lot of handcrafting in terms of like the, the specific things you do, the points of interest, like the cities and kind so of right all there, that. You can see he left his AI or his yeah, uh, co-op partner right all the way back on the planet. And off he goes, and that is really freaking cool. Yeah, which is a good way to do things. You know, and I, I thought Starlink was great, and this is like Starlink times 12, pretty much. Because so. imagine if, if you both have headsets on, and your buddy's down on the planet. Mm. And you're like, oh, I forgot, blah, 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 down there. Can you grab, blah, 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 and then bring it up? Like, I don't know. It, to me, it's, it's creating scenes from sci-fi films in a video game that I've been waiting to see in video games for a long time. Um, having that sort of flexibility in co-op that you can still communicate with each other while you're literally like on separate sides of like the galaxy, like that's pretty cool stuff. I think that's kind of next level stuff that it probably could have been done a lot earlier than it has, but it just hasn't. Um, well, remember there was a period where it was just like you just didn't make stuff in space. Yeah. Space games went away for a long time. They did, yeah. I don't know why. Save for like Rogue Squadron yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, even that. When was the last Rogue Squadron? Yeah, been a long time. Two thousand three. Is that right? Something like that, yeah. Has it been 15 years since the last Re Rogue Squadron? Rebel Strike was a GameCube game that came out before we moved to L.A. So, yeah. yes, it was, it was like Christmas 2003. Wow. 
That's hard to believe. Yep. They could revive that franchise and it would do well, I think. Yeah, but that may require EA to make a game. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a really good point. So, Matt, after discovering all this new information, are you more excited for Beyond Good and Evil 2? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. freaking lutely This, to me, just shot way up. My most anticipated yeah, list. I mean, mine was, it was already pretty close to the top, but it's, yeah, didn't hurt. Game is looking awesome. I have a feeling, though, that Wild, well, we may not see Wild now for another. You can tell that Michelle Ansel and his team yeah. are. Yeah, I'm fine if we don't see Wild if this now. is what we're getting instead. Absolutely. No, Absolutely. no worries. I, I and think here you can see, like, you know, the planet we're on is, is, you know, orbiting this gas giant. There's another moon. That's, yeah, it's not a planet, it's a moon. It's, uh, yeah. it's orbiting, there's two of them there, and here that you'll see them pull out. You know, through the whole solar system, there's uh, <laughs> I think seven seven planetary bodies Orbs, there, yeah. <laughs> and presumably they have their own satellites and, and their own you can moons, go to. probably. That's what I mean by satellite. Ah, okay. But um, and of course they're all rotating. You know, they're all revolving around the the star, and uh, as they rotate, that determines when it's night and day. That's pretty awesome. I like that kind it's, of. That's a real style. day night cycle. Yep. Real, not faked. Like I don't know if you have noticed, but in Red Dead Redemption Two, have you noticed that it it skips parts of the day-night cycle. Like, it'll go from, like, dusk to just dark. Or it'll go from sun up to, like, midday in, like, two seconds. I haven't noticed that. I've had tons of problems with that in that game. The hmm. day-night cycle's all jacked up. Then there are some other games where, like... I've noticed that night doesn't seem to last very long in Red Dead yeah. Redemption 2. I'm okay with that as long as the day lasts the same amount of time. But I've ha- I've seen many many I, I, times the day-night like, cycle in Red Dead just totally getting. No, more. I feel like the days last like three times as long as the. I think you're right, times. actually, which I'm okay with because I hate playing that game at night for whatever <laughs> reason. I don't know why. Like I hate playing that game at night. It seems like the visuals get all muddy and it's hard to like. I don't know. But anyway, I am all over Beyond Good and Evil too. As if I weren't already, mm-hmm. um, I do think that what we're seeing now is going to help the game transcend the lack of interest in the first game. Yeah. Because I, I was concerned. I'm like, wait a minute. The first game sold terribly, even though we loved it, and it's near and dear to our hearts. It didn't sell well, and I wonder if a sequel is going to have a chance. But if a game is just this good and this awesome, it doesn't really matter what its title is. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear the people that are kind of upset that they're not seeing the things they liked in the first game, like The photography here. and um, Jade. But like, I mean, you don't play as Jade. No. But you, you make somebody who looks like Jade. Yeah. And Jade's in it, so... But uh, you know, I what, I don't I don't care what you got to call this to get it out. Get yeah, it out. Either. They could change the title. They could I'd call be, it anything. Yeah, I don't really they, care. They could call it Space Monkey Mafia, and I'd <laughs> I'd be I'd be on. I hate to say it, but that is a much better title <laughs> than Beyond Good and Evil Two. Abso-freaking-lutely. Well, they're gonna have to pay Billy Joel for it because I stole it from <laughs> We Didn't Start the Fire. So. <laughs> is that where you got that? Yeah, Hula Hoops, Castro, Space Monkey Mafia. Yeah. <laughs> It's in there, trust me. But this game could absolutely be that. called Space Monkey Mafia. Yeah. And people are like, I get it. Yeah. I mean, it's also like a GTA clone. How yeah. perfect is that? I mean, the Space like Force thing there is called like Space Monkey Project or something. Oh, no, they're streams. Yeah, they call yeah. them like Space Monkey Project 5 yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, so there you go. Beyond Good and Evil 2, uh, I have a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot of that game in 2019. I think we'll probably see the game released in 2019. Worst case scenario, as Matt said... Early yeah, 2020. I think that might be maybe. I mean, they're they're kind of on a roll with like a Far Cry game every or every February. So Ubisoft is cranking it out. Yeah, cranking and if, and if they're out. skipping Assassin's Creed next year, this is right. a good replacement. They need it. They're gonna need yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. So there you go. Which Beyond is pretty good, considering I think we were, when we first saw that you know the revival of it last year, we were like, yeah, I'll see you in 2022. Yeah, yeah. but man, it came it no, came along real they fast. They really cranked on it, absolutely. and they've already got like uh, you know that they they talked about the. You know, the fan-sourced, like, art and oh, that's con- right. content yeah, stuff. Yeah. A bunch of that is already in, yeah. like, the demo. They show, they're show they showing off all the various things that they put in there, like a bunch of the art on the walls in the city are from fans. That well, the world have. is so freaking detailed. It's like you were saying earlier about, like, the eye of that huge statue, but it's like the tapestries on the walls. Yeah. It's like there's not a lot of cutting and pasting going on in this no. game, and this which is, is mind-blowing for a world of this size. And this is one. This is a game I wouldn't mind seeing go as go kind of in a games as a service direction, in the sense that like you let me play this for like a year, and a year later you'd be like, oh, by the way, for like forty bucks you can have another solar system, right? Like and just keep that rolling. I, I have a feeling like, that's I'd be, the I'd exact that. plan. I have be, a feeling. I would be completely up for that. Yep, especially with the way consoles are working now, where they're all gonna all the games are gonna scale and everything. Mm. It's like. 
that, that yeah because you know this is going to scale to the next gen platform absolutely when the time uh, it, comes. It, they'd be an idiots not to yeah. to make sure it does that so yeah i'm really excited about beyond good and evil 2 it definitely shot up i'm get i would say probably in my top five for next year now yeah i mean it's always been in my top five it's this is this thing's top three maybe top two material anyway just conceptually yeah but uh, i'm just glad to see that it it's further along than I thought it was ever going to be at this point and yeah. it looks it looks good and they've got kind of the, the gameplay loop figured out and now it's just a matter of finishing it yep all right it's time for our trailer of the week I told you guys it was going to be a short episode I don't blame you for not believing me because I said it before and then three hours and 15 minutes later yeah. <laughs> there we are uh, but it is time for our trailer of the week and this week is the 25th anniversary of doom the old shareware. Yeah. I, I was talking to Matt before we uh, before we went live, and I was like, man, all these anniversaries make me feel so old. Because with games like Doom, when it came out, I wasn't like five years old. Like, yeah. I was a teenager. And now it's 25 years old. Oh, yeah. I can get you with one better. Uh, Doom came out closer to the moon landing than today. You mean the moon landing that never happened, Matt? No, I do not mean that. <laughs> so we, anyway. We got enough people believing stupid things right now. We don't, we, we, don't need to, we don't need to further that shit. Alternative facts, Matt. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it's the 25th anniversary of Doom. The seminal, I mean, it broke so much ground. Just the gore and the violence and just creating the modern first-person shooter. It did so much. Um, and this trailer from Bethesda celebrates all 25 years of its shooting franchise. What a great trailer. Yeah, it was good. Really well cut. Yep. I was never a Doom huge fan. Yeah, I, was I wasn't a, either. I was a Pathways in the Darkness marathon guy. I played Wolfenstein way more. Yeah, I played more Wolfenstein probably. And I, played I don't more, know why. And I played, Mein Lieben. I played more Quake. <laughs> I was like, uh, Doom, Doom I kind of skipped over somehow. Quake became my, my multiplayer shooter of choice mm -hmm. for a while there it was. I played, I played fair amount of quite, and, I, and everyone else was playing Doom. I was playing Marathon and uh, Dark Forces. Yeah. Like, I just never quite, I like Doom. Yeah. And uh, I love the, the most recent Doom. It's great. Uh, I think Eternal's going to be great, too. Yeah. Congratulations That's, to Is that Bethesda. next year? Yeah. Yeah. I think early next year, too. I don't think it's like Q4. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I, I love the first Doom. I don't know if I'd really play it again. This has got a that first time through, that was a blast. Yeah, Bethesda's got a strong first half of uh, 2019, I think. And Bethesda needs it. It does. Big time. Does. All right, let's get to some questions. We're going to answer a little more uh, tonight. One, because it's a shorter episode. But two, because this is our last regular episode of the year. And you guys aren't going to have any more chances to ask us questions before we head off for the holidays. So uh, let's get to them. Oh, there's a ton in here already. Um... Herbert BF donated $100 worth of bits and should probably get a shout-out. And Snub Barracuda and Majora Tom also donate, donated a decent amount. Dude, $100 worth of bits? Are you freaking kidding me? Herbert BF, you rock, man. Are you freaking kidding me? That's awesome. Holy, wow. Thank you, man. Um, we're actually getting a lot of people approaching us at the end of the year. And I, I mentioned this in the last episode, but I know some people may have missed it or didn't make it to the end of the show. But a lot of people are asking us, like, what can we do for you guys for Christmas? They want to do something for Sifted or something for Matt and I. Um, and what I said last week is buy shirts because 
it kills a couple birds with one stone. It allows you to help us out financially, but instead of just giving the money away, you're actually getting something in return. And I promise you, you may not think you want a shirt, but once you get that shirt, you're gonna be glad you got it. They're awesome t-shirts. They're really freaking comfortable. So if you wanna do something for us as like a Christmas gift or whatever, um, buy shirts. I think that's the best way to do it. Um, I'm not gonna turn down any, any help though. So thank you so, so much. Uh, $100 in bits, that's insane. That is really, really freaking awesome. And I wanna make sure I'm getting his name right, actually. Somebody gives, me, gives us that much money. Herbert BF. Thank you, Herbert BF. You are awesome. Um, Snub Barracuda, thank you. You're always on the stream. Uh, Majora Tom, obviously you're on the stream every single week. Thank you guys. Thank you, not just for the bits, but for being a part of our stream every week because it would be silly if we sat here and streamed to nobody. Uh, you guys make the end of the show something It's honestly one of the best parts of the show. Although God knows people do it. Oh yeah, I know. I feel so terrible for them. It's like I go on Twitch and it's like, there are so many streams with nobody watching them. Like, I remember Marcus, when we first started Sifted and we were doing Game Face. And uh, we actually, when we first started Game Face, we had a lot more people that watched our episodes. Like, I think mm -hmm. we'd have like five or 600 people watching at first. And now we don't get anywhere near that. But that was not good enough for Marcus. Like, I don't know if you remember. No, I remember Marcus was, would complain uh, when, after we'd finish for the day. Marcus would be like, why aren't we at 100,000 yet? Like, he it, wanted 100,000 viewers. Right? Yeah. Because he was coming off of, like, expectations of, like, Invisible Walls days. Yeah. And it's like, bro, that's not how it works. Like, especially live, it's like... Yeah, live... Nobody... Live <laughs> is, appoint, is appointment live streaming, plus, like, just how disparate media has become. Yeah. E even in the years since game trailers. Of, yeah, of those absolutely. days of game trailers. Like, I, dude, 100,000 people would not watch a live stream if we did like a reunion of Invisible Walls. Like seriously, like yeah. if they hit like a thousand people and I just remember Marcus, like after the first few streams, he's like, where is everybody? And I'd be like, well, how many were there? And you'd be like, oh, there was like 650. And I'm like, damn, 650. And he'd be like, oh, what are you talking about, mate? I'm like, dude, what are you expecting? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So thank you guys. Like we get it. We appreciate every single person who sits and watches our stream and hangs out with us. During game like a hundred thousand people is like that's fin like LCS un like until, finals yeah like, until like until like the last couple of years it was like finals of Evo yeah number yeah, numbers that's <laughs> whatever it's a lot of people <laughs> at once so thank you guys thank you guys for donating the bits thanks to all you guys who are always on this stream uh, every single night and we've changed nights and we've changed times and there you guys are every single time so thank you thank you thank you um j reed vic we always answer one of his even though i personally don't subscribe to the notion that characters particularly leads in any entertainment medium need to be intrinsically likable is perhaps the cause of this becoming more of a roar in the games industry the fact that as games are getting bigger the average player is spending tens of hours more time with characters heightening any perceived or real strengths and weaknesses in the writing and a character's appeal yes I think you're right. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the, the longer you're exposed to something, the more the cracks become apparent. I mean, that's mm. not just with video games. That's with anything. It's with knowing somebody. When you first meet someone, they're awesome. Everything about them is awesome. You love everything about them. As you get to know them, you start to learn quirks about their personality or things that they don't like or things you disagree with. It's like that across the board with anything in life. The more you know about something, the more likely you're going to find things that you do not like about whatever that is. So video games are no different and video game characters are certainly no different so yes absolutely if we're spending a hundred hours with a game versus eight hours with a game one it's way easier to make that character seem awesome for eight hours than it is for 80 hours and, and number two the more exposure you get to something the more chance the higher the chances are that you're going to find something that doesn't quite jive with you so yeah i think mm -hmm. that's absolutely accurate i think it's also i think it's comes down to uh, diff a different style of, of approaching how you play a game in the sense that there are people who want to immerse themselves in the character they're playing and there's people who are willing to be a more removed like player and sort of like I am playing as this character yeah so like does it bother me that Arthur Morgan is kind of an, a jerk not really because I'm playing as him yeah. I'm playing you know I'm, I'm pl but there are people you know it's like it's like you run into these people that like um 
uh, not that they're wrong, but people that like, I don't want to play The Witcher 3 because I want to play me. I don't want to play as another character. Yeah. I want to play a bio, I want to play Bioware style. I want to create my character and decide who they are and decide how they behave. Um, I don't want to play a preformed character. Um, and I think the people that have, that prefer to play that way are going to be much more sensitive to elements of a preformed character they don't like. Yeah. And they're going to feel like it's intruding on their escapism when this character does things that they find re- repellent. Things that they would not do themselves, yeah. yeah. So I think that is kind of, sort of a difference between, like, can you know, are you willing or can you sort of detach yourself from the idea? Because you know, when I play Shepard, Shepard is, um, you know, there's people that play Shepard as themselves, but when I play Shepard in Mass Effect, I tended to pick, okay, this Shepard's... I played three separate playthroughs of that whole trilogy, and each time my Shepard was a different person. Right. You know, it wasn't me. It was never me. But it was, like, it was this still Shepherd, someone different. She, he, she's like this, or he's going to be like this. And she, you know, like my renegade shepherd was, it was a, it was fe- a fe- female shepherd who was like she was a soldier class. She was just straightforward. Whatever you know, whatever the the most expedient and sort of most direct method to solve whatever it was, that was what she would take. It's not necessarily what I would do. Yeah. But like that's who I was playing. Well, you were but playing a role. But I've like sh- I've like you know mentioned that to other people who are big Mass Effect fans, and they find they were like, oh my god, how could you do that? How could you <laughs> how could you do things you wouldn't do as that right. character? And I was like, well, it's. It's role playing, playing a role. That's why they're called role. But playing I think games. that's the kind of the differences. I think I think there's you know I, I would be wouldn't be surprised at all if like you took like the whole gaming population and like it was basically like almost fifty fifty split between people who play one way or the other yeah. that way and the other way. I believe that. So I would imagine that that's part of why you get you know as you get more controversial characters, you get more characters that, that are sort of playing a more um, you know pivotal role in sort of these stories that are being told. Uh, you're going to end up as character because you know, the most interesting characters tend to be people with serious flaws, and yeah. sometimes it can be uncomfortable if you project yourself into that character as hard as as you know the the, the hardcore role players do um, to accept that part of that character as as part of this character you are for this period yeah. of time. So yeah, I think that that's an ongoing thing, especially if you if you're expected to spend eighty hours with as them, let alone with them as them. That's a, no, that's you're right. A totally that's a good different. point. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Justin Horman, there was a recent list curated about unique video game urban legends. Did you ever fall for one of these? And spend hours... Untrue video game legends. What did I say? Unique. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I said it. I I don't know why I said that. (laughs) Untrue video game urban legends. Did you ever fall for one of these and spend hours trying to unlock something like Naked Lara Croft or searching for the Yeti in GTA? No, although I you know, I worked in an arcade in high school, so I watched it happen a lot. <laughs> um, the, you know, when the Sheng the um, the uh, Sheng Long uh, thing in in the EGM April Fool's joke, where um, you know if you I think it was you had to you had to play Street it was Street Fighter Two because there was the whole there was the, it was a mistranslation where Ryu, Ryu's win quote says uh, you must defeat Sheng Long to stand a chance. And that's actually a mistranslation of Dragon Punch. It basically means you have to be, defeat my Dragon Punch right. to stand a chance against me. Yeah. Um, but people interpreted that to mean that Sheng. It was just an urban legend came up like Sheng Long was Ryu's master, uh, who would we we would know now as uh, uh, um, uh, Guy Ken or you know the the, the old man in, in Street Fighter Four who was their actual actual master, oh, Ak- I don't Aku- Akuma's uh, counterpart, um, uh, Go Ken. That's okay. What it was. Yeah. Um, but back then we thought it was Shang Long was was his master and like you have to defeat him to be you know it was like a kung fu thing sort of, thing. and so EGM ran that April Fool's joke where they doctored a bunch of screenshots and made it look like you know Shang Long was like this guy in gray yeah, I remember that with now, a ponytail. Yeah. Yep. He's I mean Akuma comes from him. Akuma comes from this April Fool's joke and um, he uh, so the idea was like I think it was if I remember right um, you had to play the game. You had to get to M. Bison on one quarter without getting hit. You had to win all the round without getting hit. That's what they told you. you had yeah, that's what yeah. they told you, you had to do. Yeah. And then you had to, you had to win. You had to, you had to go twelve. It was either ten or twelve mat rounds with Bison. Um, never get hit, and the time had to run out. So you had to draw <laughs> every single time. And after oh, the boy. after the tenth draw round. Shang Long would come in, throw Bison off the screen, and then you'd fight Shang Long. Yeah. Now, of course, you could never do this because A, that's ridiculous, yeah. and B, <laughs> I'm pretty sure after like four rounds, it auto kill. It's just yeah. like it goes draw game, and everybody has to put a quarter another quarter in. Right. Um, but we had people coming in 
doing that, trying to get that to work for like a month. Have you never gone on a video game wild goose chase like that? Not really. I, I have. I, I, I didn't believe. I, I was. People would yell at me because I'm like, that's not real. Like you know, that, before they even announced it was an April Fool's show, I'm like, it was in the April issue. Like, what do yeah. you think? I mean, come on. Like, yeah. and we had people that do that. We had tons of people that would get came in and kept trying to find the nudalities in Mortal Kombat two. Um, there was a lot of like NBA, when NBA Jam was the new hotness. Like that was a thing where people would come in. Trying to, unlock trying to unlock characters. whatever. I mean, yeah. it could be anything. You, you know, yeah. it was, you know, for, once Bill, once Bill Clinton was in there, like, yeah. and then no, the people were like, like, it could be, it could be, it yeah, could you be. know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I saw that a lot, but it was. I don't think that we ever did anything like that. The closest I probably came was like when my friend imported uh, Street Fighter Two for the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom, rather. Uh, there were a lot of rumors about what the code was to play same character versus same character. We would try those a lot because there was no way to know if you were putting it in wrong or if it was yep, fake, you know. Yep, exactly. And eventually, there was a real one, and you could, you know, you, you we got it. But I remember spending a lot of time trying various codes that we were told this is the code. Codes were too hard to put in. Yeah, like they. I don't understand why they made codes so hard where you had to do it like this rhythmic pattern and like it's like yeah. just let me go up, up, down, down, like. Make it simple. As long as I get the commands in the right order, let me fucking do the code. Like I, I would say that was like the closest I came. I don't. I never really did that for, you know. I've, I've done it. A bunch I probably would have not tri- in a long time. I probably would have tried to do that more often with like Street Fighter Two if I'd had for like the Shang Long thing if I'd had money. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's right. A, right. If you get that's a problem. It cost a quarter to try every, it. Every, every time. time I try it. Uh, back when the N sixty four launched, I got sucked into a lot of stuff like that. I got sucked into. Uh, you can play as Luigi in Super Mario mm. 64, and and the, cra- the the crazy part about it is the people who start these things, they make them so tough, yeah. so burly, like 20 steps and all this dumb stuff. It's like now go over stand stand over in this corner and jump three times. Now go into the painting and go to this world two three and do and you know they send you on this crazy thing and it never works. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you know, but it's like you said, like, Bill Clinton was in NBA Jam. So it makes you think anything's possible. Well, the problem is, is that some of the stuff is accurate. So, like, if I was playing, like, Wave Race 64, and they're like, do this, and a bunch of dolphins appear. Mm-hmm. And you do it, and the dolphins show up. And you're like, okay, this is legit. And then they're like, well, now do this to get this. And it turns out that one's fake. So it's very easy to get sucked into that if there's one thing that works. Because it makes you think, oh, well, then probably all these work. And then when you try to do the next thing, you're not willing to give up as easily. Because you're like, the last one worked. This one should work. I'm just doing something wrong. So, And that's I, why humans are bad at calculating probability. You're right. But I have, I have absolutely, I fully caught to it. I have been caught in stuff like that I before. Did, I did have a roommate in college because I had the N64 in my dorm room. And he got obsessed with the stop and swap thing in, yeah. in Banjo. There's Kazooie, a perfect example. The ice of it. key. There's a per- I I did too. I he, got totally. He would and just he would spend the whole time. I'm like, stop ripping the cartridges out of my system. Like I was like, because I because I don't know if that's even true, but I was you know there was that the the the, the conventional wisdom at the time was if you pull the game out while the system is on, you can hurt something. You can hurt the system. Well, that's that was how stop and swap was supposed right. to work. You really were supposed to pull a card out right. and then put the but, new one in. But it got to a point where he was like, he would get to the thing and do and do whatever he thought he was it was the way you're supposed to do it. And then you like swap it with like every one of the cartridges I own. I'm like, you're gonna ruin all my fucking N64 yeah. games. Stop it. Well, then as it turns out, you could just butt stomp codes into the room right. that unlocked all the keys anyway. And that's when that, but I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, and there were all kinds of conspiracies. Like, go here and run around this three times and then go back here. And, and, and that pad that you butt stomped on, oh, that was ripe for mm-hmm. conspiracies. Because you can butt stomp anything in there you want. So they'd be like, butt stomp like Snuffleupagus. Hmm. And that will unlock one of the keys. And so you go in there, and that's like 18 butt stomps. And then it doesn't work. You're like, oh, well, maybe one of my butt stomps was on two of the letters. And, I, and so you do it again. Like, mm-hmm. I've absolutely been sucked into that stuff. But it hasn't happened since the 90s for me. Yeah, it's, it's I just never had the patience for anything. So I was like, ah, oh, you do it. Yeah, I had a friend who was big on, on kind of ways. Like, oh, my friend said you could do this, or my dad, my uncle works at Nintendo yeah, and yeah. said you could do that. And all that. <laughs> I was like, all right, show me. No, yeah. all right, I'm you going can home. do it. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. Uh, w. Matthew Sega revealed that Project Judge, the next game from the Yakuza team, uh, will be getting an English dub in addition to an English subtitles that are unique to Japanese and English tracks. What do you think traditionally Sega has not dubbed games from that? Why? 
why do you think traditionally Sega has not dubbed games from that studio? Yes. So I think it says, what do you think? Because it's a change. What do you think? Question mark. Because it's a change. Oh, what do you the... think? Traditionally, Sega has not dubbed games yeah. from that studio. I don't, I don't know. I'm surprised. The last Yakuza game they dubbed was the original PS2 version of Yakuza 1, um, which was not the most well-received dub in the world, although there were some funny parts in it, maybe not intentionally. But um, I don't know. I think that's interesting. Um, it's a what? little surprising it that is. they chose this game instead of it a is. Yakuza game. I think at a certain point, Yakuza is expected to be subtitled. It was, it was like, you know, Yakuza, also, Yakuza makes a lot of sense to still be in Japanese. It, oh, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a game about Japan, about a very uniquely J- Japanese organization with a lot of uniquely Japanese values. Yeah. Um, and I think it makes sense to not dub that because it's never going to come off right yeah. in, ja- in, in English. I was so, just thinking about the expense of it. Yeah. It's like if you're going to spend the money to do it, wouldn't you do it with a game, a franchise that's way more popular? Well, maybe they're thinking they could make this one popular. Yeah. Now that they're starting. I don't know about it's, that. It's hard, it's hard to drag somebody on board with something that has a five or a six at the end if it's going to be as story driven as Yakuza. Um, and also, you'd have a, a kind of a revolt on your hands from the fan base because it's like, well, now they're all different. You know, right. Like you want it, you want consistency in, in that kind of thing. Yeah. But if they think this might have some potential to break out beyond the usual Yakuza fan base, if it's not the same sort of like, you know. Uh, I mean, it looks very similar. It looks similar. It looks similar. <laughs> it looks like they're using the similar part of the city and everything. But if it's kind of really taking like a, a page out of Ace, Ace Attorney. Um, it might have a little more verve to it than for a more casual player. I don't know. Like. I'd be surprised. It's interesting that they're doing. I mean, I'm just fascinating that they're they're going to actually spend the money to to put a dub in there and and you know make the localization of this thing even more complex. But they've at the same time, it's like it, what else have they got? Well, they've also already announced it for the West, which is very rare for them yeah. to announce a new game and almost immediately say, "Hey, it's coming to the yeah. U.S." Well, it's coming pretty soon too. It's it like, is like mid next year or something. Yep. Uh, let's see. The more stuff we can get out of that team, the better. As far as I'm concerned, yeah, their games are great. Translate Ken's on you cowards. Chevelle Man, 1979, have either of you bought a PlayStation Classic? And if so, what did you think of it? I canceled my order for it because no. I didn't buy it either. As soon as I saw the thing about PAL, all the games that were PAL, I was like, out. Yeah. yeah. And I know you can actually, turns out you can go in and change that. Um, but like, I, I didn't care. And at a certain point, it, it really did come down to like, what I, do I want to have that? Or would I like to have an extra hundred bucks for the Christmas season? And I was like, I'll just take that. I'll take the hundred bucks. bucks. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked about it before. I don't think that the PlayStation 1 games have aged especially well. There no. was really nothing on it that I was jonesing to play, except for Destruction Derby a little bit, but I know what's going to happen is I'll play that for, like, one match and not care again. Yep. I'll be like, yep, this is exactly as I remember it. It's just as crappy as I remember it, and I have no interest in playing it anymore. I will say they... I didn't yeah. even ask for it for Christmas as a gift, actually. No, I will, I'll say if they, like they, they dug... If some people dug into the system and found, like, a bunch of... You know, they didn't... ROMs that they couldn't get the clearance for. Yeah, it was like... It was like a, clearly th- games they tested on that were not part of it. And, like, that list was great. It would have been, was a lot yeah. of good shit in there. Um, they had, like... Uh, they had the Circuit End, and they had... Uh, they had stuff... You know, a different lineup could have gotten me to still be on board, even with the bare bones and sort of lackadaisical... Uh, presentation they had but like that lineup is just there's nothing there and, and, honestly, and, and all the worthwhile stuff I already have on disc I never got rid of my, any of my PS1 games I still have them all I still have hardware two different kinds of hardware that can run them all um, I, it's just there's they no should reason. have just loaded it up with classic JRPGs in my opinion I feel like that would have done just fine like I think more those, people like us would have bought it throw, then throwing Metal Gear throwing like the standards but like yep and, it's, and it seems like that's maybe the end of the, the classic console thing. I think it's now that Nintendo's saying, like, yeah, once once Christmas is over, we're not restocking the NES Classic or the Super Nintendo Classic, so yeah, get PSA, them Yeah, PSA, by hot. the way, if you want either of those, you need to go get them over the yeah, holidays. the NES Classics are pretty plentiful at Best Buys right now, so I would say if you want one or you don't have one or want to back up or want something to keep, because they're probably going to sell for a lot of money in another year or two. If you think about it. Yeah. They probably will. Like, a lot of money. If not even next year, but like 10 years from now, yeah. 15 years from now. Yeah, so they're going to focus. I mean, I'm a little disturbed by that just because it's like, hey, how about you put some freaking Super Nintendo games on that, you know, the, the on the Switch before you start shutting down the, the Super Nintendo Classic stuff. Good point. Because um, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, I'm, I'm more of a Super Nintendo fan than an NES fan. Me too. 
And, Absolutely. Uh, that would that would. Well, I bought the SNES Classic. I did not buy the yeah. NES Classic. And I, you know, I I haven't played a lot of the NES, you know, whatever you call the NES service on the Switch. Um, although I, I haven't either. I haven't really touched it, other than the day one to see if it worked. Like I've looked at it here and there, and they're they're updating, they're putting new games yeah. in. It's, it's a decent, but it's all like NES stuff. I'm not that. I've, I played to death, or I already own, or I don't. You, but uh, you know, and I like the idea where they're kind of putting up the special editions of them, where like you start Gradius uh, off with like right. you know, all your power ups, or they put you late in the game in they're Metroid and Metroid stuff. You to... Just to like, you know, let's see the casual fans see like a later part of the game or something like that. That's cool. But if you were doing that with Super Nintendo games, I would be super on board with yeah. that. Like that would be that'd be extra fun. Yep. Um, so yeah, Give me, I don't know. Maybe I just want to play Actraiser again. What do I know? <laughs> Here's one from Vincent. You said you're anticipating Beyond Good and Evil Two a lot for next year. But are you confident enough to consider drafting it? No. Nope. <laughs> I learned my lesson, finally. I, I don't really think it's coming next year. Uh, Although, you know what? Now that we have, like, the two alternate picks. It wouldn't be a bad thing to throw in at the end as a surprise, but, like, I don't know. Like, it's uh, it looks pretty far along. I don't know does. what else they put there. I know some people have said, like, Watch Dogs 3, maybe, but I feel like Watch Dogs 3 is still not... I feel like we didn't heard of it. Heard of it. I think now. it probably should be coming next year, though. It probably should have come this year. Really, yeah. I, mean, I mean, Watch Dogs Two was a while ago. Um, I don't know what two they're years. doing. Two years. Two Watch Dogs Two. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Watch Dogs uh, been a while. It's uh, I don't I so I don't know what's going on with Watch Dogs Three, but if they're this far along with Beyond Good and Evil, I feel like we're going to see Beyond Good and Evil first. Um, I mean, we've so obviously seen a ton of BG and E already, so. That would lead you to believe that. I don't know. Maybe I just don't want to believe something that awesome. I probably won't draft it. it I've learned my lesson. Yeah. I, uh, finally, I took a hard stance with our draft this year, and I did much better. So I'm going to stay on that path going forward. Uh, Derek D, 111, BG&E2 with a game that I didn't believe was actually going to, c- to come out, but it looks like it will. What is a game you guys gave up on that reappeared and was great? Hmm. Good questions tonight, guys. That's a tough one. Mm-hmm. So first of all, you have to even think of a game that reappeared and re- yeah, released. Yeah, a long time. I don't know if that's ever happened. Yeah, everyone I'm thinking of did not turn out great. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. It's like when they reappear, typically it's because they're in trouble. Yeah, they just got to get something out. And then if eventually, if they do make it out, you see why it was in trouble. <laughs> I can't yeah. think of anything that went away and then came back and was um, great. Uh, Eternal Darkness. Did it go away? Yeah. It, well, uh, yeah, because it was an N64 game. It was an N64 game, game and, and then it kind of disappeared for a year or two, and then it came back as a GameCube game, yeah. and it was great. So, yeah, I'll go with that. It's yeah. not It's not the, br- the, you know, the gulf There's of time. There's actually several games that are like that, like Dinosaur yeah. Planet, Dinosaur for N64, Planet becoming Star Fox Adventures. Eventually became Star Fox yeah. Adventures. I don't know if I would call Star Fox Adventures great. I would Fox call it Adventures great, but it was great. good. It was good, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. There's a couple examples. That's all right. Yeah, that, that, it was more of a that was more common in the uh, in the in the days when Nintendo would delay something until it was good. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nintendo still kind of does that. Um, yeah, do you... ma- hopefully Metroid Prime Four. Let's yeah, maybe next that'll be the next one. I'm definitely not drafting that. That's no, for damn sure. No, definitely not. <laughs> uh, Super Court on Blue. Do you think the Epic Game Store will eventually eat into Steam sales? Given the fact that Epic will only take twelve percent of the game's revenue, while Steam and other platforms take thirty, yes, we talked. Did you not watch last week's show? Yeah, there's. I mean, there is. It has been pointed out to me in the in the since then that like there is like a thing you can you can opt into on Steam that gives you everything, you know, hundred percent or something. Yeah, there's there's oh, other really? options you can take. Um, so there's there's devs I know they were not as as they're a little more skeptical of the Epic Game Store getting that kind of traction, but um, well, today Discord undercut Epic. Now, Discord is only taking 10%. <laughs> this is great. This is so. Well, Sifted Store can be the first to pay developers <laughs> to put their games on it. And no one will make any this money. This is what we're talking about, though, when we always say competition is good. It's always good. That's why if you're a fan of PlayStation and you see a great Nintendo game, that's good. That's good for you even as a PlayStation owner because competition makes people raise their game and they'll make better games. Whatever they're doing, they're going to do it better. They're going to strive to do it better. And you're seeing it. Look at this. Epic comes in, undercuts Steam. And literally a week later, Discord's like, eh, hold my beer. (laughs) And now it's just 10. So how low can it go? We are about to find out exactly how much it really costs. 
Somewhere Gabe Newell sadly cancels his next Ferrari order. Yes, oh, yeah, or his <laughs> fleet, his, <laughs> his livery of Ferraris that are on the way across the, the ocean right now. It's, but we are about to see how much steam has been gouging us all mm-hmm. this time. And how well steam can react. And truth be told, look, ban- the cost of bandwidth has come down a ton yeah. since steam was launched. But steam has never passed those savings on to the consumer. No, steam was always... Its, it's profit margin has just yeah. increased and, and I think increased. The, the argument you would probably hear for that internally, or at least from, from Valve, would be like, well, we're the ones who took that risk originally, so we're going to keep reaping those profits until someone makes it impossible for it to do, and I Here guess that are. day has come. <laughs> the day has definitely come. How, how much do you think they can cut down? I can't see I it getting can... less than eight. Eight is, I mean, that's bare bones... Because you, you know, still look, you still have to pay people to operate. Yeah, to you still got them. You still got the margins for operation. It's not just about how much it costs to send that file. Like someone who wanted to do, wanted to go like like Elon Musk, cutthroat, psychotic with like employees. We'll lose a ton like of money, em- but we'll make treatment. a ton because people will invest. I mean, like more like employee treatment. Oh, if you wow. want to like run a people ragged in a like a borderline indentured servant situation, like yeah. you maybe drop it to five. But that would be cra- that would be like I don't think that'll happen. Bare operations, like you must, you, you would have to have an end game in in place. You'd have to be Elon Musk, just and that. you'd have robots doing everything. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Which is pretty much what he's doing at this point. Well, not yet. Um, Congrim one, what are your thoughts on the Street Fighter Five sponsored content? We'd be watching any of the Capcom Cup. I'll probably watch the ca- the finals on Sunday. How do you feel about seeing ads in games that you paid full price for? It's silly. Um, it's a way to get like more fight money for like to to buy like the outfits and stuff. But the real problem is that like there were there were a couple way good ways to get like a fair amount of fight money, like the the dramatic battle or co op battle or whatever and stuff like that. And like they've repeatedly nerfed those to basically herd the the players into into using the the in you know the in stream ads. And like that's annoying. Like I don't really use the fight money for much. I us- I tend to just buy the packs when they're on sale, like during the tournaments, because they usually do pretty good deals. Like, you know, on outfits or whatever. Like, you know, six months to eight months after they come out, you get a pretty good deal on something. Um, I just play the game to play the game when I do it. Um, but I totally understand why people feel like they're kind of getting they're getting like free to play railroaded in this game they paid fifty bucks or sixty bucks for, and it's like yeah, that's and like. Yeah, you're st- are you still paying money every year, every season to subscribe and get the new characters and stuff? It's like, Capcom, how 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 hard do you want to squeeze that stone? You know, at a certain point, it's just it can't you can't be losing that much money, like right? Yeah. Like it's it, 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 the business model feels very scattershot right now. So I don't know. I think it's I think it's silly at best and sort of sleazy at worst and. Uh, I guess my real opinion on that depends on where, what they're advertising to me. So, yep. I don't know. Here's a follow-up as well. Um, do you think Microsoft, Sony, or Nintendo would ever cut their share down to 12% or lower? I don't know. I, I don't know if they really have that same kind of pressure because they, they own the platform. Exactly. It's a closed system. Yeah. Nobody can come in and compete with them. Like, yeah, you can't you, like you nev- can't undercut Microsoft to put something on an Xbox. Yeah, I mean so. you can't ever sell Microsoft's first party games. You can't sell Nintendo's first party games. It'll just never happen. Yeah, I mean the so. closest you get is like a brick and mortar store selling like Titanfall two for five bucks in a bargain bin, yep. which I've seen everywhere this year. Yep. So yeah, I, they're they're safe. They're basically in a closed system. They're yeah. clo- their own ecosystem where they can set prices and do whatever they want. Yeah. And the only way you can change that is by not buying stuff. Mm-hmm. And if you don't buy stuff, then the prices will drop. But otherwise, yeah, they they hold all the cards in that case. Yeah, if you if you could end run around that, someone would have done it to Nintendo by now. Uh, oh, absolutely, that's for sure. All right, we're gonna call it right there. That's it for our Q and A section, uh, and that's it for the last normal episode of Game Phase for 2018. It's been a great year. Thank you guys for going along with us and uh, watching us every week. We really appreciate you guys, especially the folks who are on there every week. And you guys just asked probably the best questions of the entire year right Mm -hmm. there. You guys knocked it out of the park. So one last episode of Game Face. It's not really Game Face. It's our Game of the Year episode. That is on Tuesday night. The Game of the Face. Yep. Uh, Tuesday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be back. And that will be the last stream for 2018. I am getting out of here next Wednesday to fly back to the East Coast. And I will be back there until at least past uh, New Year's, a day or two past New Year's. 
Um, as I've mentioned before, it's Christmas and then my wedding anniversary is December 28th and we always do something for a day, day or two for that. So um, let's see. Uh, if you want to buy shirts, you should buy them in the next few days. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to get shipped out until after we get back from the holidays. Um, and otherwise, yeah, just get ready for our big game of the year blowout on Tuesday. And we'll see you then. Game Face is up and out. <laughs>